Okay, good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015. We'll start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're opening the public session of the meeting now. The board previously had an executive session tonight where we discussed graduate respective deployment security personnel or devices in connection with HOPCO. We conducted strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations of non union personnel relevant to the town manager. And we discussed the character of an individual with a financial interest in the pending 110 Grill LS Hopkinton LLC. We designed it on the agenda later on this evening. We'll open the public session now with a uh, public session. If anyone would like to come forward to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government, please take them. Right. Seeing no takers, we'll move on to the consent agenda. I'm on the consent agenda tonight. Item one, a resignation. The board will accept the resignation of Amanda Fargiano as a town's representative on the Metropolitan Area Planning Council Board. Item number two is appointments. The board will consider approving the following committee appointments. Barry Rosenblum as a representative to the Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisory Group from the Upper Ch Charles Trail Committee, a representative to the Pratt Farm Master Plan Advisory Group from the Department of Work, Public Works, and Mr. Kamal, we should probably never knew that person. Eric Sonnet as a representative to the Irvine Tadaro Properties Advisory Group from the Upper Charles Trail Committee, and Ellen Scordino as the representative to the Irvine Tadaro Properties Advisory Group from the School Committee. We don't like to break out any of the items that I said to I'll break out item two because I'd like to know the name of the DPW person. So, okay. Do we have a DPW person? We don't have a name yet. We can't do it Okay, fine. So, Chair uh, Lantin. Uh, Mr. Chair, are any other candidates here this evening for these appointments? Mr. Sonnet or Mr. Rosenblum? Rosenblum. That's fine. You want to come on up and uh, let's break that out. Well, I, yeah, fine. We'll just do them both at the you same I mean? time at this point. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Brett. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Can you introduce your the name and address and just introduce yourself? Eric Rosenblum, 10 Briarcliff Drive. Could you, would you like to talk about why you'd like to be on the uh, press farm master plan advisory group? Well, as a representative from the Upper Charles Trail Committee, um, I recommended uh, you know, myself in the in the committee, we I thought I would do a good job on representing uh, the purposes of whatever the mission is of that team. It's an advisory team, I understand. That's about you know, as a person on the trails committee for several years, I think I'd be a good representative. It's really a big component of what we're trying to do there, so right. I think it's great to have you there. Mr. Hurry, do you have any questions? No, I'm good, thank you. Mr. No, I'm just enthusiastic that we're going to have somebody from that committee. So thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Mr. Green, that's a great committee. Mr. Sistar. Yeah. No questions. Okay. okay. That's very good. So, Chair, I want to a motion to approve the consent agenda on items one and two. So moved. Second. Motion second. Do we have any further discussion on any of these? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. I oppose present not voting. That's unanimous. So, um, consent agenda is set. Moving right on to item number four on the agenda, the 26.2 Foundation update presentation. The 26.2 Foundation will give a brief update on the Foundation's recent efforts. Mr. Feldhoff, welcome, sir. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, excited we uh, could find the time to have this uh, conversation uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, and we have uh, a number of slides, and it, with your permission, I'd like to move quickly through uh, sort of the historical perspective, which uh, you're familiar with, and focus really on uh, current activities, priorities for 2015 and 2016. Before I begin, uh, I'd like to recognize Stephanie Whalen, who's on the board of uh, directors of uh, the 26.2 Foundation. Quick look at the agenda. I want to spend a a, a lot of time down in here. Uh, you're familiar with, uh, with the mission uh, of the organization uh, that's expanded over the years. I think the important part in terms of the history, uh, these are the kind of programmatic, uh, the, the, the approaches that we use in terms of the kind of programs that you're going to hear about. Uh, but the most important part, two, a couple of highlights. <coughs> Founded in uh, uh, 1996 in conjunction with the 100th Marathon, 
And when we formed the then Hopkins Athletic Association, it was done in conjunction with the Board of Selectmen and also the Boston Athletic Association. We transitioned it to, to the 26.2 Foundation when we began to uh, realize that what we had here in Hopkins was far bigger than just um, a, a focus on one particular community. Uh, the highlights of that first year included uh, $110,000 that went towards the unreimbursable portion of the high school track. Uh, and then down through, we've done some other things with uh, the relationship in Marathon Greece. The, the Marathon Flame, which is now beginning to travel all over the world, this, was, uh, the only, this is the only place in the United States where it still uh, burns. But that's just a, a and, and be happy to drill down into any of these if, if you like. But I want to spend a few minutes talking about Hopkins Marathon Footprint. Um, you've heard me say before that uh, this is the only community uh, that hosts the start of a major marathon that has the footprint that we do. Uh, I didn't make that up. Uh, it's real. If you go back uh, to the 80s, when, in fact, the Boston Marathon was going through an extremely difficult period, there was some doubt that it was going to continue. There were three people from Hopkinton that were on the BAA Board of Governors that stabilized the event and set it up uh, for Hancock and others to come in to make it a, a very, very successful commercial venture. Uh, the sculptures were all done uh, real, not with public funds. Uh, the one on, uh, on, on your left, the Spirit of the Marathon sculpture is at mile one. Uh, the George V. Brown sculpture is at, at the start. George V. Brown, uh, in addition to uh, his family, in addition to keeping the marathon going, is in the Hockey Hall of Fame in uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, he's really the first sportsman in, uh, of Hopkinton, quite frankly. They also, at one point, the Brown family owned the Garden, the Celtics, and the Bruins. Um, very, very prominent, obviously. And then finally, the, the, the Hoyt sculpture. And I, I, I've said it before already tonight, I'll say it again. Those kinds of uh, iconic uh, marathon-related structures do not exist anywhere else. There might be a sculpture. Uh, there's a sculpture on, uh, in Newton of Johnny Kelly, but there's no community that I know of that has those kinds of iconic uh, uh, structures in town. One of the things that's uh, developed, and I'm sorry you can't see this very clearly down here, but this 26.2 Desire to Inspire program was started by uh, Deb Pinto. Uh, I just found out today, by the way, Deb Pinto was a phys ed instructor at the, at the middle school. She has just been named uh, the outstanding physical education uh, educator in the Northeast and will go on to a national competition uh, with one of the uh, association, largest associations for physical education in the country. But the program is pretty simple. They use the marathon as a base, and these teachers have taken uh, the marathon theme and run it through math science um, uh, in their English classes uh, across the board. They do, they do several of events. Uh, there is a 2.62 uh, uh, event that they run. But here's the trick now. The trick is that they've been able to take this marathon theme and drive it through other uh, areas in the classroom. And they, they did a little poster campaign. You can see this one on the right. I will shovel 26.2 uh, pounds of snow. So they challenged the kids to do something because not everybody's going to run a marathon. So it's a pretty neat program. Uh, the other interesting that, the thing that I came across last week that I was not aware of, uh, this is not just, uh, come, how can it doesn't have a marathon? It has a marathon footprint, but it has a running footprint. There are 90 kids in the middle school that are running cross country. 90 in the middle school. There are another 90 that are running at the high school level. The middle school had a little a cross country meet the other day, and they had schools from, uh, two schools from, uh, from Natick, for example. Those two schools didn't come close to having 90 kids. So that's not us that are doing that. This is inbred now, and it's, uh, it's really developing. Uh, and you'll see uh, in, a, in a minute some of the kind of priorities that we're talking about. The third time, this does not exist anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. Uh, that mosaic, and there are two now, that, that comes out of one guy, John Cop <coughs> Copley, working with high school kids to develop, again, an iconic piece, an iconic piece of art. 
And I think one of the things that we don't do enough of, that I'm hoping you will, as a, as a board, will challenge us to do more of, and that is to take that story and socialize it. Uh, we, we've got a powerful story to tell, again, reaching beyond the marathon into the classroom, and, uh, and, and the students that helped uh, to create that mosaic, and they did it, and they stood at the starting line in the cold weather, and they caught that shot of the women's race. Uh, and then with uh, some leadership from a guy like Copley, we're, we're able to develop that. The Marine Corps Marathon, uh, as with Boston, we're locked into uh, a tradition where olive branches that are dipped in, in gold. In the Marine Corps, uh, Marine Corps Marathon's case, it's gold, silver, and bronze wreaths that come from Greece that are presented to the winners in the Marine Corps Marathon. Uh, that, that, uh, that wreath uh, also gets replicated for Boston. It's the only two places in the world where, where, this, is, uh, where this is done. But again, from my point of view, I would, I would hope that you would challenge us to do more with this connection. Um, I happen to be very proud of the fact that I've had the opportunity to spend uh, some time with the guy who's in the, the picture on the, the lower, lower uh, right-hand corner, who's the new the 37th Commandant of the Marine Corps. And, and, and I think the challenge for us is how do we get uh, someone from this board to start coming down and, and, and being involved in those kind of, an, uh, kind of events. What we do when you're on the ground is we promote Hopkinton. Uh, it's pretty easy. And we connect Hopkinton back through the Reefs to the, the highest ranking people in the United States Marine Corps. I, I spent a fair amount of time uh, two weeks ago with the governor of, uh, the governor of Virginia, uh, McAuliffe. Uh, we were, uh, again, able to talk about Hopkinton. And it was really fascinating because he said, well, let me, let me tell you a little bit about Hopkinton. And I'm, I'm scratching my head, what the, what's this all about? I've run the Boston Marathon three times. I know all about Hopkinton. There's nothing you can tell me. But that's, that, that's an advantage for us. But I don't think we, uh, we take, we really do take advantage of it all, as much as we ought to. These are the, our, our priorities going forward. Uh, I've talked to each of you individually about this International Marathon Center. I had a, a, a rather uh, helpful kick in the butt a couple weeks ago from the chairman. Uh, this is a great idea. It's a great idea. But you know what? All we need is uh, somebody to put uh, some money on the table. So we're, we're working right now to, to finalize a prospectus based on a feasibility study that we've done. Uh, and we want to launch that, uh, that uh, initiative because it's a, it's a good idea, but unless we can and that money, by the way, in my humble opinion, will not come. It won't be public money, and it probably won't come from this region. But there are companies, uh, global companies, that are going to be interested in this. And we've started to get that, uh, that sense. Plan and develop a cross-country course. Um, there is a <clears throat> terrific uh, property behind the high school. There are a group of uh, citizens that have been interested in a, for a long time in developing a cross-country course behind the high school. It's an advantage for, for our kids. Uh, right now, they run at the state park. And if you know anything about cross country, uh, cross country courses are not run on roads. And that's basically what they do. They do a terrific job with that. But pe people like Peter Lagoy and others uh, have now come together. Uh, and we want to move forward and utilize that property connecting with the center trails. And we have very smart people who understand how to do that, including Peter uh, and others. This maintenance fund, we have these great sculptures, but uh, the Kerry Kitty's sculpture went in in about 2006. But uh, I don't know if you know much about bronze, but it pits uh, and it needs work. Uh, it has to be uh, sandblasted, re patinaed. Uh, all of those have been done privately, and we expect to raise the money privately to create a fund that will keep those in good shape. Uh, and the Kiri, the, in fact, work on the Kiri Kiri's, uh sculpture at Mile One will start this Thursday, uh, the sandblasting and repatina. Uh, there's also a possibility, there's some changes down at the Legacy Farms on those corners, uh, the four corners. And uh, uh, we'll be back to you uh, possibly to talk about relocating that sculpture in a more prominent place. Uh, next year is the 70th anniversary of the of Stelios Kiri Kiri 1946 Boston Marathon. Victory is a big deal. He beat Johnny Kelly. Uh, Kerry Keaty survived the Nazi occupation of Greece. 
came to Boston uh, rather frail, was told he couldn't run. He begged uh, for the opportunity to run Boston. He, he uh, ran and won and went back to Greece and was met by a million people in the streets. Um, strengthen the partnership with Parks and Rec. We have uh, uh, started discussing the possibility of, uh, of uh, either purchasing the land uh, uh, adjacent to the Legacy Farms property. Uh, and if, uh, if we do that and move in that direction, there's some real possibilities to build something big. Um, if we move, when, when we move forward on this International Marathon Center, it's not a room like this. Uh, it's got to be a substantial structure. And this community has an oppor opportunity to build a, a center of excellence down the street. Uh, and, that's, and we're talking with them about collaborating. We do a lot of work with the Consul General of Greece. That'll continue. Um, we want to work really hard at, at expanding the footprint that I've spent some time talking to you about. And that means we need to recruit some people locally. People like uh, Michelle Murdoch and others help us. Uh, and it's, it, quite frankly, it's Michelle that's helped develop the, the, this brand. Uh, in, uh, and you see a lot of stories in the independent. And then finally, uh, in, in terms of priorities, we want to take what we already have and we want to communicate it. We want to share it. We want to share it with other communities. What's the work that's being done in the classrooms uh, in, in utilizing the marathon as, as, the, as the platform is not being done anywhere else. Uh, every sixth grader in Massachusetts has to study ancient Greece. And the, at the Department of Edu Education curriculum people are now interested in what we're doing here in Hopkinton. So we want to do that. And then finally, the request. Uh, these are the same uh, elements that we talked about um, a year ago. Uh, and, they're, and they're basically simple, straightforward. The new one is uh, the support for the cross-country course. Uh, the rest of these uh, we've gone over in the past. And we would appreciate uh, your support of those requests. And then finally, I think that says a lot. Uh, and that's where we're focused. That's where you're focused. That's what that, that's what that uh, statement behind uh, Brian is. And uh, we think that this marathon footprint fits into the long-term <coughs> vision in the community. And it's probably the best vehicle we have to promote it. Thank you, Tim. It's wonderful. Go to a resident marathoner to start, Mr. Hur. Can we go back to the request slide, please? Number two, what can we do to help you there? Well, uh, we'd love uh, th this community, uh, this group made up of, uh, of citizens of the community. Uh, we'd great, it'd be great to have one of you uh, serve on that committee with us. Uh, th that's number one. That's the, most, that's the easiest thing. And then that, as we move through the, the process, we obviously go through the school committee and we have, to, we have others. So somebody from the Board of Selectmen uh, uh, to serve on that group would be really helpful. Okay. I think you guys do great work and, and I really like the idea of the cross country course, assuming that the school committee and uh, the athletic director and everyone are on board. Um, we've got some great spaces back there in which to cut a trail and run. It's fun to go back there now. So I'd be happy to help in that regard if, if that's something my colleagues are interested in working with us on. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Catino. I don't see anything about the uh, Marathon Center on there. But uh, is, isn't that the backbone? Number one. Okay. Okay. Number one. Very good. I, you know, I, I, I so appreciate you always being out there. If I may be, be, be so bold, we either do this or we move on to something else. It's time. Thank you for marketing Hopkinton so well. Mr. Sistari. Yeah, Tim, it never ceases to, to amaze me. Uh, you know, you keep carrying the, the torch on this, and it's, and it's great to see the energy that you put into it and the success that you brought over the years. Um, and, you know, certainly we want to help support you and... and help to see you succeed so that you can help Hopkinton succeed even further. Um, on the kind of the newest, the newest component that you've put in here, this uh, the cross country course, do you see any stumbling blocks? Have you run into any so far? Or do you anticipate any that uh, you think you're gonna need help with? Well, I think the, you know, the stumbling blocks for, for non cross country people is how do you design the course? There, 
people like Peter Lagoy and uh, uh, Ryan uh, Davenport, who, by the way, is, an, is really an, a, a, an elite runner and runs for the BAA, they, they can figure that stuff out. Uh, that's not the problem. The problem is to, is to shift people's mindsets from uh, a history of running at the state park, for example, to creating what will be uh, a true cross-country course. There's a, there, there, there's a little resistance in that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't want to build just a cross-country course. We want to build a series of trails that, that the community can use. This, uh, trails are a big deal in this town, as you all know. Uh, and we, we hope to design this in such a way that uh, that the community will really, be safe and people will have access to it. So we have, i to be honest with you, and any of these ideas, I, and we talk a lot about this, I haven't anybody, anybody pushed back. Yeah. I just haven't. It's not that hard. Great. Thanks. Good. Mr. Mosier. Thanks for coming in, Tim. I'd, I'd love to, to throw a shoulder behind this cross-country track, I mean, seeing the participation in the middle school and what those kids got out of that program, be able to expand on that uh, for the other kids that run and, and have, have a track that, that really reflects the demand in the student body, that would be fantastic. Um, the other things you're working on, I've, I've, seen, I've seen the enthusiasm the school has received, uh, some of the educational projects you guys are working on, so like, that's fantastic, and uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of this of the Marathon Center as well. So keep up the good work and, and let me know how I can help. We proposed a motion um, that if, uh, if it was entertaining, it would be a wonderful end to this presentation. Right. Okay. Um, you guys have it? Right. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Just to you want to do it? So I, sure. two things I want to say first. A, I, I, I like when you come in very much because of all the private groups we work with in this private public kind of way, you're by far the best at coming in, telling us what's going on, telling us what you've done, telling us what you need from us. Not, not everybody does that, and sometimes they hold it against us. But, I mean, it's, it's great that you actually do this and come in and, and sort of um, and have an ask. I, I, we like that. We like it when people come in and we can do things. So that's the general comment. The specific comment is this cross-country course, is this going to be built in, entirely on, it, it, have you contemplated yet where you're going to put it specifically, by which I mean will it be on school land or some town land or I assume not private land? Have, do you have any sort of a rough? Yeah. There is a, there's one loop that uh, might be on proper, private land that we'd have to get uh, a variance to use. I don't, I'm not sure that's the right word, but most things on town owned, school owned, school owned uh, property. Okay. And, and by I, the way, yeah. pri private, private. We're not, we're not going to look for uh, town mm. funding for this. Even better. So, um, <laughs> so, right? So, I think we all love the center trail. That's been a phenomenal addition yes. to the town. I mean, and it's such, it's such a nice setup, and and the artwork there was terrific. So, I mean, anything like that, I think, would be wonderful. So, what I would say is. I would suggest you talk to the school committee and see if they'd be on board with this in some fashion. If they are, then I think we would quickly move to put a, put a group in place to actually lay this out on a map. You'd have our support on the town land for sure. Um, let's get the schools. Let's just get going. I mean, I think, I think every, you heard. I mean, everyone thinks it'd be a wonderful idea. We'd love to do it. Anything that enhances the trail network the community would like. So let's just get it done. Um, so may, just tell us if, if there's a pathway with the schools, come back, we'll get a charter, we'll get this moving. Where's, where's the, uh, there's the What's chairman the, over there. There's okay. the, several members of the school committee. All right, well, we'll put them on the spot, make it be there, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they think it's a wonderful idea. Okay. So let's, let's just do it. Let's, okay. let's, get it, let's get it going. Um, we don't need to talk about it. I think everyone will be for it. Let's go. Okay. With that, Chair will entertain a motion to, actually, Chair will entertain a motion that, the Board of Selectmen recognize the 26.2 Foundation as a key community asset, express our support for them to continue to pursue their mission for the benefit of Hopkinton, and encourage the Foundation to pursue the priorities outlined in the presentation, and I will add, in particular, the cross-country course. So moved. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Second. Chair, yeah, I would, I'd just like to add, uh, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about the new item on the list, and that being the, the cross-country course. but. I think after, um, between the marathon and then after our recent 300 celebration, there's somewhat of a consensus that it would be great to have something that brings more focus to the town um, multiple times a year. So we've got the marathon, you know, and it was nice this year to have the 300 celebration. It kind of balanced out about six months later. 
the International Marathon Center and the, the proposed center, you know, this is something that could bring focus to the town you know, 365 days a year. And so there wasn't, uh, there, there wasn't a lot said about it today. I know that, uh, Tim, you know, you're, it's something that you think about and you're working on 365 days a year. Um, personally, I'd love to see you know, this start moving at a much, much more rapid pace. Um, and when I say that, it's not to imply that it's not moving along, but you know, it just uh, it hasn't it hasn't been incredibly visible. Um, but uh, you know, it's something that I'm excited about, and any support that the board can give around that, you know, I think it, it's something that helps the town as well. So, with your approval, uh, give us uh, two months, and we'll be back here with a with a complete update. Consider the date. We're, we're running in a marathon pace, and we need to we need to start running at at least a middle distance pace. Okay, that's a date. We'll have you in end of the year, early next year. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mosier, just follow. a quick question, for Tim. Would would that follow up? Would that include any other properties or or um, conceptual locations? I guess for the, for this project. Uh, the, one of the, the one of the pieces of property, property that we've looked at very seriously is land adjacent to the, the legacy farm uh, piece, uh, the Spangler property as we refer to it. I happen to think there are other possibilities, but that's on the race course. And again, there's no other there's no better place in town, but there are other locations that are possible. Okay, thank and you. I think we have to look, look at the economic reality of this. Amen. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Do we have any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's Thank unanimous. You. Thank you very Thanks much. for coming in, Tim. I really like it. Tim. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is staff appointments. Action item. The board will follow a firm. The following staff appointments by the town manager, the finance director, the IT director, and the finance administrative assistant. Mr. Kamal, over to you. Or not. Take it away. Yeah, through the chair, I respectfully uh, request the board affirm three appointments. And with your permission, Mr. Chair, um, may I ask Mary Shell to come to the podium? Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming in tonight. Yes, um, I'm presenting Mary Shelley as the next administrative assistant in the finance department. Uh, her primary focus will be payroll. I am delighted to share with the board that she uh, possesses 25 years of payroll knowledge. Uh, and what we also found very attractive in her candidacy is the fact that she's very familiar with the ins and outs of the general ledger, balancing and withholding accounting. Uh, as you know, uh, we are putting a concerted effort in actually building up our financial capacity on the first floor. <coughs> and the last two hires that we have brought in have had specialized <coughs> experience in the jobs that we are asking for together with general understanding of accounting. Uh, she has implemented numerous financial and payroll modules. Uh, she has worked with Shakespeare, Unifund, Munis, and Softwright. As you know, uh, we have spent the last, I think, uh, 18 years uh, working diligently in transitioning to Munis. Uh, what we found attractive with Mary Shelley's candidacy is the fact that not only does she have the hands-on experience in payroll, but she also has the front-end software development uh, expertise together with training. Uh, she has been a trainer for uh, Softride, which is in fact uh, Munis' competitor. She's experienced uh, with creating, utilizing uh, crystal reports, uh, but most importantly, uh, as we edge towards the end of the calendar year, I want to highlight the expertise working with uh, the 10940Cs, the 941s, and the W2s. Uh, this will be our second time, second year, uh, preparing W2s for town and school employees. Um, the references that we check with uh, uh, characterized Mary as follows. Uh, she is solutions oriented, always works in the best interest of the customer, is an excellent trainer, uh, she's familiar with the new authority of the Act requirements. Uh, as you know, the Act does impose certain requirements on, on, on public agencies, and we will be relying on her expertise in moving us forward uh, in implementing some of these requirements. Uh, she was described as having a wealth of knowledge with regards to payroll. 
and she understands payroll and the varied conceptual pieces of it with regard to the software component. Uh, she is the go-to person with regard to anything payroll. Uh, she is a professional, detail-oriented, and very dependable. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank, thank the HR director, new, our new payroll manager, Chrissy, uh, John Nis from the first floor, um, as well as Maureen Pinel, who did assist in, um, uh, as members of the hiring committee. Thank you, Mr. Kamalo. Mary, welcome. Thank you for thank coming you in. Thank you very much. Again. So, um, uh, what we'd like to do is just let, let go around, let board members say hello and ask any questions they may have. So I'll go over to start to Mr. Sestari. Hi, Mary. Welcome to Hopkinton. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions for you, but um, you know, I, I'm sure that you'll find some challenges in the work, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll uh, rise to those challenges, and we look forward to seeing you progress through the, through the ranks here. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Katina. Welcome. Thank you. The uh, town manager makes a great MC for introductions. <laughs> it's doing my eulogy. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, actually, I only have one. It, it's funny. We're putting the, the Munis system in uh, in the last, uh, what, 13 months, 15 months, 12 months. It's been uh, challenging for us. How does Munis compare with the competition? And oh, boy. Munis is <laughs> very heavy in personnel, which my, um, my current software, software is not. So you uh, made a good choice for the personnel side of everything. You can hold all of your information in one place, where software, unfortunately, you still have to keep those attendance cards someplace in the secretary's drawers. Um, and, but I loved Munis. I transitioned from Unifund to Munis at Wachusett School District and hold them. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Mr. Mosier. I really don't have any questions. It just sounds like you have an ideal background, and uh, look forward to you bringing that skill set here. Uh, as uh, Suckman Catino pointed out, had challenges with Munis, and it would be great to have somebody that's familiar with the system. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Uh, Mary, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I have a couple of general questions that I ask always during this time, uh, not so much for the board's edification, but for those at home that may be confused about what we're doing. Uh, so to Mr. Kamala, if I could, Mr. Chair, who's laughing at me over there. Uh, this is budgeted. The position is budgeted. The position is open today. The position is open. Uh, was posted uh, following the town uh, spiders. And the position is not a new headcount in town hall? Not a new headcount. In fact, uh, she will be replacing Michelle for the whole more of the school team. Here ends the general questions. Thank you. So, uh, Mary, tell me, uh, Mr. Kamala did a great job introducing you, and, and I could tell through the tone of his voice that he's very excited to have you join the team, uh, and we value his opinion very much, so uh, welcome. Free cash, free cash certification process. Have you been through that? Do you understand it? Is, have you heard about what? I understand it, but I, as a payroll clerk, in my responsibility when I was a clerk at Washington and Quabbin, I was only pro had to provide reports. So you provide, you put it out what was available, yes. and then they took it from there back to the towns and to the state. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Great. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mary, we're big fans of paying people, so it's good to have you on board. And uh, we're looking forward to you getting started. So Thank you very thanks much. again for coming in. Thank you. Okay. Next, Mr. Kamalo. Um, this we're going to make it both, or we'll move on to the next. We'll do them all at once at the end, I think. How's that? Moving on, uh, we can okay, mention Joshua Rossetti, the town's next information technology director. Because we might want to switch some of them around if we like somebody for a different position. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Thank you for coming in tonight. It's very nice to meet you. Yes. Um, uh, through the efforts of the following uh, uh, panelists, uh, Mike McCann, the town's IT consultant, Ashok Kosh, who is the director of IT uh, on the school team. Uh, Joe Bennett uh, is the surgeon in the police department. And Maria Casey, the HR director. I uh, am happy to present George, Joshua Corsetti as the town's next information technology director. Uh, he possesses 13 years of experience in strategic and operational IT leadership, budget preparation, financial analysis, project management, contract negotiations, procurement, and hands-on information technology implementations. Uh, he also uh, was the Vice President of Information and Technology at the National Fire Protection Association. 
Uh, he also was the Network Administrator, Information Technology manage, Manager, and then Director of IT at Triumvirate Environmental. Um, we, during the interview, I think what impressed us most was his uh, experience working both in the private sector as well as in the public sector, non-profit sector, that is. Uh, he also was the Systems Administrator at Middlesex Savings Bank. Uh, he holds several certifications in IT, I will not miss them, but his training, uh, which I want to highlight, uh, he has undertaken the training, training uh, Underwriters Laboratories Global Leadership Program, CEO Leadership Program, in, conduct, in conjunction with the faculty from Babson College, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, Dale Kennedy Training Leadership Training for Managers, and New England College of Finance in association with RW, Kaiser and Associates. Um, why, why I highlight this training is that throughout the interview, uh, he impressed us in terms of his understanding of uh, business processes and we feel that we've been an asset to the town in terms of how we move forward uh, in, uh, in improving our efficiencies. Uh, he has received the following key awards, Service Star Champion for Exceptional and Exemplary Customer Service, Long Term Award for Strategic Decision Based on Empty Sustained Success, uh, he also has been a volunteer, as I've emphasized to the board. One of the things that we uh, look for during our hiring uh, or interview processes is that we look for people who are focused on building communities and are willing to give back to their community. Uh, he has been, as I said, a volunteer at Summit Montessori School uh, as a trustee. References, they told us that Josh is a trusted advisor on IT strategy. He has superior technical ability and is a pleasure to work with. He's a phenomenal resource, builder of social and political capital, and has a can do attitude. He's innovative, he's cool under pressure, he has the right mix of technical expertise and customer service, and he's a leader, he's a great listener, and one of the best professionals in this profession. Uh, his strengths include intelligence, uh, he's organized, he's inquisitive, he's articulate, he's well rounded, and he's well, this is an extremely even community. And that share the board. Goodness gracious. Okay. Josh, very nice to have you with. <laughs> he is. He's writing my eulogy. There's no question about it. Um, <laughs> So, Mr. Sestari interviewed you during the process, so I'm going to go over here and let him start. Yeah, now you know the expectations that uh, Norman's setting as you, as you come in the door. I did have uh, the opportunity to speak with Josh as well as a few other candidates, and we had a very impressive field uh, that, that we brought down to the finals. And uh, So first, I'd like to commend the hiring team uh, for, for bringing that field forward. Uh, Josh was particularly impressive. Uh, he not only looks good on paper, but when you speak with him, he's articulate. He can walk you through the different things he's done in his career. Uh, and, you know, again, those, those accomplishments, as, as Mr. Kamalo stated, uh, you know, they range from, you know, being at higher levels uh, with strategic vision right down to the operational levels and working with the end user and helping them understand how to use the technology that he's setting up. Um, you know, one of the other things that, that I liked hearing from Josh was uh, that from his understanding of the network that we've had set up and the infrastructure that we've had set up in town, uh, he sees it as a very solid foundation and one that can take us um, to the next level without, uh, without totally rebuilding it. So, you know, that's good to hear. It's, it's good to hear from the perspective of uh, the last person that Mr. Kamala brought, brought in-house. Uh, he did a great job and he helped get us on good footing and now it's something that uh, that uh, Josh can continue carrying the torch on. Um, you know, Josh, congratulations. I'm glad to see you coming in house. Uh, you know, we have high expectations of you, but nothing that we don't think that you can meet. So uh, best of luck and I uh, hope you enjoy working in Hopkinton. Thank you. Over to Mr. Mosher. Uh, first, I'd like to say thanks to Todd for putting effort in this process. Um, so the only thing I didn't see on here was inventing the internet and writing an app. <laughs> so, Al Gore did that. Yeah. It, this looks like fa a fantastic win for the town. I mean, I think Todd uh, put it put it very well. Having somebody that understands it, but can also articulate that and implement that with people that need the help. Um, and then I assume once you're here for a period of time, you'll start to see how systems can be improved and take a look at the bigger needs of the town and and where you can take this experience. So. Um, I'm really looking forward to you being here. 
and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Hur. Looks like a great fit. Thanks for coming in tonight. Uh, my typical questions to the town manager so that everybody at home understands what's going on here. You want to just rattle it off there? Budgeted. And it's not an additional head count for the town? Not an additional head count. Okay, great. Yeah, I did have an opportunity to speak to some of the candidates. I thought they were all great. They were phone interviews. Uh, for the mo they were all phone interviews. And um, uh, I thought we had a really good field of people, at least those I spoke with. Uh, so I provide some feedback to Mr. Kamalo and then kind of let it go from there. But I think uh, this sounds like a great fit for the community, and I think it'll be a great fit for you as well. And welcome to Hopkinton. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Catino. Yeah, I love seeing the, the whole gamut of system admin, network admin, and even help desk uh, to, to what Mr. Cesare was talking about, that you can bring it right down to the... To, the the, the basic brass tacks. But the thing that I, that I love seeing the most on your resume was um, ensure IT strategy and vision is aligned with the business requirements and overall vision. And that was something that I was, that, that over the last several months when we haven't had anybody that I was the most nervous about. Because we were, it seemed like we were buying things and doing stuff without a person overseeing it. And seeing you come in here with such a strong resume and and such a strong introduction. It's, uh, thank you very much uh, for considering us, and I'm glad you had a great choice. Happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. Josh, yeah, thank you again for coming in. What, um, have you, do you know anything about the, the state of affairs here, and have you got any initial thoughts about what you need to do early on or where you need Regarding, to go to start? Um, specifically the IT systems or more? Anything. Board of Selectmen, I don't care. Yeah, I'd, I'd mostly like to hear about your IT. You know, <laughs> yes, <but>. Um. <clears throat> I've been brought somewhat up to speed in um, speaking with, with Mike, um, the consultant, in terms mm -hmm. of the systems. Um, and, you know, my understanding there is very contemporary. Things are in good shape. Um, I know there's some, uh, some big projects coming up, specifically the, the library move, um, which I'm sure we'll, we'll be involved with. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the biggest, okay. as I understand it. Okay. But nothing here looks remarkably out of touch with what you did before in the private sector? No. Okay. No, not at all. Good. All right. Well, we'll hopefully test whether or not you cool under pressure soon. Let's see if Mr. Kamala can live up to that. So, excellent. Thank you again for coming. I'm looking forward to seeing you here. Again, with the chest commission mayor, Chris, welcome to you. Thanks for coming in tonight, Mr. Kamala. Go for the hay geography. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Through the efforts of the four individuals, I am happy to present uh, Chris Sandini as the town's uh, uh, CFO. Glenn uh, Peleco, Mike Manning, and uh, the committee representatives from the small region and at the end of the interview process. Uh, John Westerling, Rob Thomas from the school team, Elaine Lazarus, the director of land use planning and training. Maria, Maria Casey, the HR director, uh, were uh, part of the team that uh, interviewed uh, Chris. Uh, Chris is coming to uh, the town with 19 years of public sector experience, uh, having worked as the director of finance and IT, uh, Josh Yevanala, uh, and also town accountant for the town of Hudson. Uh, his former experience uh, includes working for the Marlboro Retirement System, working as an auditor and CPA for McCarthy, Hargrave, and Company. Uh, some of his accomplishments include securing a three-bond rating upgrade for the town of Hudson, uh, spearheading the program that removes tax title properties, generating excess revenue for the town, and uh, acting as the interim executive assistant uh, at the town manager position in Hudson. He has saved on numerous ad hoc committees. Uh, he has also acted as the Chief Procurement Officer for the Town of Hudson. Uh, he's a member of the MMMA, a Mass Society of CPAs, Government Finance Officers Association, Mass Municipal Auditors and Accountants Associations. Uh, these references reveal that Chris is, uh, he possesses uncompromising integrity and ethical standards, sound fundamental accounting knowledge, is a great business partner to uh, whoever he works with. 
an excellent problem uh, solver, fantastic communicator, he's a hard worker uh, and works reliably under pressure. Uh, he is very uh, skilled at learning quickly and adapting to new situations and I think that's a skill he developed when he was working as an auditor having to move from one town or one firm, from one firm to the other. Uh, I, I am happy also to share with you that uh, when I conducted his references, uh, I heard a very moving story about Chris as a, as a human being. Um, he did help, uh, and this was said say very fondly, and the person I was speaking to really wanted to uh, give me the details of the story. Namely, that Chris, on his own, enabled one of the senior employees in Hudson to continue earning a livelihood by driving him daily to and from work. Mm. I think that's remarkable. Um, he is easy to t talk to, he's always eager to help. Uh, he does his homework, he's always prepared. Uh, he also told me, and this was confirmed by the people I spoke to, he does not like to sleep. Uh, so with that, I'll open the mic to questions from the board. All right, good. Uh, going over to Mr. Moja to start. Chris, thanks for coming. This is, uh, again, looking at the, we've had a fantastic batch of um, employees this evening, and, and you've continued the streak here. Uh, but seeing kind of IT interspersed here, um, you know, with in addition to the financial roles that you've had, uh, so it's like it's, it's a really good matchup. I'm, I'm curious as to what the Superior Officers Bargaining Unit is. Can you give me uh, a little insight into that? Sure. Uh, the superior officers, lieutenants, sergeants, and the captain uh, were non-unionized uh, for the entire time up to the last few years that I was there. Uh, they subsequently decided to unionize and formed uh, the first union, and I was part of the negotiating team and the lead negotiator uh, for a time being uh, for their first contract. That's great. That must have been a, a valuable experience. And also your experience with the Marble Retirement System. I've been a board member for 19 years. I Statutorily, I'm the fifth member, which is appointed by the other four members, and I cannot be part of that retirement system. And I'm, and I'm part of Middlesex Retirement System, not Marble Retirement System. So, well, fan Fantastic. Look forward to your contributions. I'm sorry? I look forward to your contributions. Thanks. I do, too. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Hur. Hi, Chris. Hello. Hey, Mr. Chief, I may. Please. Brian, he's run six marathons. I need a permission that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kamala. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hi, how, how you doing? doing? Um, congratulations on the marathons, by the way. It's not easy to do. Thank you. The town of Hudson, what's the budget there? $65 million last year. All in. Excuse me? All in, both sides. Or Schools. Oh, schools. That's correct. All in, yes, 65 That's million. Correct. So the resume looks great. Um, as Mr. Kamala has a little fun with me this evening, you look like you could be a great town manager candidate someday. <laughs> I, I sort of consider this position to be uh, of that level. In Hudson, the executive assistant, the town administrator in Hudson, is also the CFO. Okay. So. Uh, oh, how interesting. Keep it up, Mr. Kamala. <laughs> Good hire. We, like can we go into executive Chris? session? I'm trying to go to shake and take on a whole new wrinkle here. All right. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get him on board first and we can reopen some conversations. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a great background. Uh, this is a finance role. I, mean, we're, I think it's a little bit more segmented here than Hudson, perhaps. And uh, so you're comfortable going that finance path and staying on that finance path, at least in the short term. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, actually. Um, I, I just hired another person in my department. And, and in Hudson, we do the entire soup to nuts, uh, from placing the ad to uh, checking references and uh, having them fill out the paperwork. Everything is done by the department head in Hudson. So uh, I'm looking forward to shedding those duties. Okay, great. I think it looks like a perfect fit for the community. Thank you. Okay, over to Mr. Sestari. You know, when I think finance, I think Chris. 
<laughs> is this number three? It is. I'm just happy I don't have to remember another name. <laughs> Chris, welcome aboard. Um, you know, a lot of fine things have been said about you, uh, both both uh, on camera and off. So uh, we're looking forward to getting you on board and you coming up to speed and uh, helping us out. And Thank we you. wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Catino. Welcome. Thank you. You get a much shorter commute now. I do. That's all. It's coming right down West Main Street. It's not bad. <laughs> no, nope, well, it's in the morning. It's, it's kind of tough in the morning coming down West Main. Uh, but it's, it's good to see we got another person from Hudson. We're, we're, uh, hope we don't, they don't become rivals and start poaching us next. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know, really it's, it's incredibly, <laughs> incredibly impressive. The only thing I was wondering is it's, I saw you as you were a CPA and starting in 1994, and it's inactive. Do you have to be? Do we need a, an active CPA? You're going to have to reactivate that or anything? No. Oh, okay. But um, welcome. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming. It looks great. I had the opportunity to meet Chris during the interview process. It was terrific. Uh, a great candidate. I really enjoyed the conversation. He's got some great thoughts about a lot of things that, that we continually wrestle with in town. So I'm very excited to have him here and get going. So um, uh, I think it's a great position for him, and I think it's going to be great for the town. So thanks again for coming in, Chris. I have no questions. Very happy to have you here. Mr. Chair, I'm yes, sorry. Sir. Real quick. So it's budgeted, Mr. Kamalo. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not new headcount or additional headcount. What was the third? I forget what the third was. <laughs> think I'm going to help you? <laughs> yeah, right. But I just want to make sure everybody at home understands this is a replacement of a current position. Got it. Great. Thank you. Good. Okay, with that, the Chair will entertain a motion to approve the following staff appointments by the town manager, the new finance director, Chris Sandini, the IT director, Josh Grossetti, and the finance administrative assistant, Mary, I, I forgot Mary's, Shelley. Mary Shelley. So moved. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion on this? Mr. Chair, the start Sorry. date for all three candidates, please. Um, Chris Sandini, no November the 12th. Uh, Josh, November the 9th. Uh, Mary, um, actually, is, is, is to be determined, um, but I should mention she's already working with Vitana as a project specialist. Okay. Okay, thank you. You good? Yep. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present on voting. That's unanimous. Welcome all of you to the town of Hopkinton. Thank, Thank you again you so for coming much. in. <laughs> Next time on the agenda, and we're running late here, is Ko Sushi and Grill Kino application. It's an action item discussion. The board will have a discussion about whether to object to a Kino license being granted to Ko Sushi and Grill by the Massachusetts State Lottery Commission. Mr. Kamalo, do you have any... Um, Background to give the board? Yes, realizing though, through the chair, um, that the applicants are not present, I believe we. Oh, if they're not here, let's push it. Yeah. And, and we'll get to something else. So, okay. Can someone let me know when they show up? If they show up? Yes? Go ahead. I think, in terms of just scheduling tonight's meeting, um, we should proceed and then the board can act on this uh, at a later time. Yeah. Remember, the board only has 21 days to act. Days are up, so we have to do something tonight. But they're not here, nor are they going to be here. Okay, we'll pick it up later. We'll pick it up later we'll, on the back end. That's great. Okay, in that case, we'll move on to item number seven, a public hearing. A Rafferty Road tree cutting request. This is an action item. So the board will hold a public hearing on a proposal to cut 117 trees on Rafferty Road as required by Mass General Law 87, Section 3. The tree warden held a public hearing on this matter on October 19, 2015, at which two residents objected to the proposal. Therefore, pursuant to Mass General Law 87, Section 4, this proposal is now subject to the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen. So, I mean, that, that is the point here. The tree warden concluded it was okay. The planning board has been in favor. This is part of the special permit. They actually sent us a letter today from the chairman, um, but it automatically comes up to the Board of Selectmen when somebody objects to the tree warden's decision. So that's why it's here tonight. Mr. Kamal, do you have anything further to say, or should we just call Lane up to talk about it? Yes, just to mention that we have Elaine Gaza was present, as well as uh, Mr. Gleason, who is the tree warden. Okay. Can I ask one or both of you just to give us a, the board a real quick overview of how we got here and, and what you think? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Road. No, I don't want you. I'm sorry. Not yet. <laughs> 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 okay. 
No, I don't want you either. I want a town person. I want, I want Elaine or the tree warden. <laughs> Thank you all for your volunteerism, though. I appreciate it. I'm Paul Gleason, the tree warden. Um, I was informed that uh, 117 trees were uh, needed to be removed for a sidewalk to be installed on Rafferty Road. Yep. And for the widening of Rafferty Road at the uh, intersection of Cedar Street. Um, the trees were posted as required by law. The hearing uh, was set. Uh, received two uh, letters of uh, protest prior to the hearing. Uh, therefore, a hearing was not actually held because uh, pursuant to the law, it says that once I receive a letter of protest, it immediately becomes your ball, your ballpark. Okay. So you didn't actually get to have, have your hearing? Excuse okay. me? So you didn't actually do anything? You didn't actually get to make a determination? There was no actual hearing held yeah. because the, the letters of protest had been received prior to the hearing. Okay. Thank you. Link, can you just talk briefly about what the planning board thought sure. of all this? So putting this into uh, context, uh, during the master plan special permit process in 2008-2010, um, reviewed the uh, construction of Legacy Farms Road North, which goes from East Main Street up to Wilson Street, and it hits Rafferty Road right at the Wilson Street intersection. So everybody coming up Legacy Farms North is going to come right through Rafferty Road 285, and that provides the bypass to downtown that takes up to perhaps 10% of the traffic out of the downtown and brings it, uh, brings it up here. So as part of that process, um, they looked at some mitigation for Rafferty Road, make sure it's wide enough and safe enough for traffic, the traffic that's going to be coming up there that doesn't go there now. And as part of that is pedestrian safety. So the road is now about 21 to 21 and a half feet wide. It becomes a uniform 22 feet and a five foot wide walking path, meandering sidewalk will be on the north side of the road. As part of that, the board also required that they conform to the DEP stormwater management standards. There's a lot of uh, stormwater there that's uncontrolled. This will control it, will in infiltrate it all the way along the road. Uh, there's some gullies in there that have been formed over the years with the blocked culvert. That'll all be taken care of, and the road will be upgraded to accommodate the additional traffic that's coming. So the board approved it last night after a couple of meetings of review uh, with uh, six conditions. A uh, couple of which I included in the were included in the letter to you today. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Mosier, you want to start this one off? Thank you, Mr. Polico. Uh So I was just reading through the planning board's letter, which we got this afternoon from the second, uh, from November second. And I'll, uh, you don't mind, I'd like to note the three bullet points towards the end of the letter. Please. The planning board approved the plans as me on November 2nd, 2015 with conditions including every effort shall be made to retain existing trees where possible, even if the approved plan shows that a tree will be removed. The planning board or the tree warden may approve field modifications in order to retain trees during construction. The work will be done under the supervision of the Hockington DPW. A road center line should be painted in Raffrey Road and fog line should be painted along the edges. These are traffic calming and safety measures. Um, but I'm not sure if, if some of the folks that have shown interest in, in this were aware of this letter. And uh, those first two bullet points uh, to me seem like they're, they're emphasizing uh, for flexibility uh, to retain any trees that would otherwise be unnecessarily cut. Okay. Is that the case? The, the major concern seems to be the canopy. People like the canopy very much and they don't want it damaged. What's going to happen with the canopy? They expressed concern about that as well, but they felt that the, the area is heavily wooded. It's going to stay that way. It's cutting back maybe 10 feet or so along one side of the roadway, and they felt that that canopy, there'll still be a canopy there. Um, it's just we need to accommodate the, uh, the additional traffic and the pedestrians at the same time, trying to achieve that balance. And the, the plan went through a number of iterations, started out with a lot more disturbance than it shows now, and it was really pushed back as much as possible. Okay. Do you have any more questions? No, I just wanted to get that out there so that people who showed interest could consider that before they get to the microphone. Okay. Ms. Gattino, over to you. Yeah, um, we are watching several of the meetings uh, with, the, with the planning board about this. Uh, the, the planning board took it very, very seriously. Um, as, as when I was on the planning board, removing trees is, 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 is difficult for anybody, especially some of these that, that, are, that are older, more mature trees, and, and the canopy is important. 
Um, however, we do have to uh, consider the safety aspect. Is that you know originally we we wanted uh, 24 foot roads in there, and and now we're trying to uniform it to uh, uh, 21, 22 feet. And um, and I and I really believe that um, the chairman, even though we don't always agree, um, it, it, with these last uh, these these first two points, is really uh, trying to make it. Uh, as palatable as possible, and still having safety as the main concern. That's it. Uh, good. Yeah. Mr. Howard, you. So specific to those first two points, who's going to make the decision, and how and when is that decision going to be made? Specific to trees that should be spared. In that, uh, are we going to go out there as a board and walk and vote yes or no? I mean, what's the process that we're going to follow? Oh, you're asking us. Well, the planning board and the DPW are going to oversee it. That's listed in here, and the tree warrant's going to be involved as well. So they, they'll actually go out there and be involved. Now, mm -hmm. the desire is to protect trees. I think, well, actually, I should just go to you and ask you. I mean, how, how, will, they, how will they do this on a daily basis? I think the planning board is thinking that the tree warden will take the lead on this and be present to make any decisions that are necessary. And a board member will go out to augment that if necessary. Okay. Question? So, I mean, we're going to deliberate, I think, here a little bit more of this because we still have to hear from the public. But my sense is I like the, the intent to try and make sure that they spare as many trees as possible and fully support that. But I want to have a clear process that we're going to follow, or they're going to follow, whoever they is or are, to um, be consistent in what they do. And I think if it's the tree warden, that, that makes excellent sense. I think if it's the tree warden, a member of the planning board, voted by the planning board to have the authority to go to the tree warden to make that decision, makes sense. But I think there has to be a vote there. And then I would suggest that there should be a third uh, individual uh, on that walk or whatever within that decision tree uh, that should be considered either by the planning board or this board or somebody who that is to make sure we've got some input along the, the way besides the two uh, first members I suggested. I just so, think that we want to save as many trees as possible. We should get a couple of different opinions about those trees as that happens. Mr. Chairman, quick comment before you um, you want to get are, you other are you done? Just for now, yes. Specific to that. Yeah, that's fine. I just want to go to Mr. So, he had, so, so there are, so it says in the bullet points, the planning board or the tree warden may approve field modifications, and then the work will be done under the supervision of the Hopkins and DPW. So that's, so that's three entities right there. I think what you're getting at is maybe something in addition to that, but I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sistari. Questions? Thank you. Yeah, I do. Um, could we just, I, I just wanted to get clarification on the process for having the hearing with the tree warden. Might I understand that there can be a hearing set, but as soon as there's any opposition, then there is no hearing and it comes to us? This, the current discussion, uh, it Okay, I'm just confused as to why there's even a process that involves a hearing if it's just going to be, basically it's not a hearing, it's, it's a rubber stamp, yes, if there's no opposition. Or I guess a rubber stamp, not, not so much a hearing as a decision by the tree warden if there's no opposition. If there's any opposition <laughs> at all, then it automatically comes to us. I think the intent of the law is to allow for a discussion to occur. Questions can be addressed during the hearing. However, if there's a, a formal written uh, opposition to the, the, the uh, proposal to cut down trees, that then escalates the discussion to the person. Okay. And so you came to no publicly made decision of your own? Well, once I received the letters of protest, I okay. said it's over. Okay. So uh, my next question is, uh, first of all, I mean, from what I've heard, and, and I can still be persuaded, but to me it sounds like any trees that need to be taken down for the widening of the road, I think that that's a necessity for the public safety aspect of the road. Um, what I'm questioning is how did we arrive at the decision that a sidewalk is necessary on the street? Because I see one building there, and I don't really see any 
destinations going up and down the street. Um, you know, a, a busy road on the western side, you know, and what's probably going to be a busier road on the eastern side. And so I'm trying to figure out why we're deciding there needs to be a sidewalk there. During the public hearing process, there was a lot of discussion of the Bay Path Humane Society, which is the one building that's there. The dog walkers are up and down that road, and there's no safe place for them to walk today, let alone when there's additional traffic going through there. So there's a lot of activity there with uh, people walking the dogs at the Humane Society. In addition, the state park is right there, and the Upper Charles Trail Committee and other trail groups are considering linking, uh, strongly considering linking the center of town to the state park through this area. So when we've talked about the sidewalk, uh, we've talked about going through DCR property to get to the downtown area. So it's part of a larger trail link from the downtown area to the state park. And we do have the Humane Society there with a lot of dog walkers uh, up and down that road. on, a, on what's, a what's the cost of the sidewalk? 150 bucks a foot or something, isn't it? Go ahead. Uh, do you know the answer? Uh, Just, uh, Roughly. What's the punchline? Uh, What's the sidewalk cost? Hundred grand. Thank you. And so, by the fact that we went to Roy, I'm assuming that it's not funded by the town. That's correct. The work will be done by Legacy Farms. Okay. Um, I, you know, I mean, sorry, Roy, but uh, if it was being funded by the town. I'd be wondering why we're spending $100,000 on a business when they seem to be the primary uh, group that needs this sidewalk. Um, as far as a coordination of trails and, you know, things like that, I see something, you know, it's, it's running close to the lake, you know, not really getting you much closer to the lake. I guess in the end, for my taste, if there's going to be a sidewalk there at all, um, I actually liked, I think it was in Mavis's letter, um, the suggestion of, you know, having there be a buffer between the road and the sidewalk and having, you know, I mean, that's a wooded area. It's DCR land. It'd be nice to have something that's kind of going through the woods, maybe not meandering through the woods, but, you know, not necessarily pavement that's coming up and meeting pavement either, um, but something that has a little bit more of that, that, that feeling that you're out in nature. Um, you know, that's, that's my personal preference on this right now. Does that mean that trees don't get cut down? Probably not. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, I think that it gives a better feel through that area. But that's not really the decision we're making. Sure. If, if, can we talk about if that's a plausible alternative and then whatever else you have to add? If you were to take the sidewalk, as you, you do, you're suggesting, and you meander it or just or put it even on a straight line through the woods, you're probably going to wind up removing twice as many trees because you're going to cut the root system of not only the ones that are near the edge of the road where mm -hmm. the proposed sidewalk is going to go, but now you're going to impact trees that are going to be on the inside of the, well, what will be the new, the two, two sides of the sidewalk as opposed to just one. So you're going to actually impact double or triple the number of trees as opposed to the original plan. So doing something like that really really puts people to a test on how green they are. <laughs> or how practical. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're going to keep going on this, but we have a posted public hearing I need to open. So um, item A on the agenda is a posted public hearing at 8 o'clock tonight for Hopkins and Spoon Wine and Malt License. Proponents Hopkins and Spoon Incorporated DBA the Spoon, the location 77 West Main Street, Lumber Street. The board will open a public hearing to consider approval of an application for a Section 12 wine and malt only restaurant license for the Hopkins and Spoon Incorporated and forward to the APCC for their affirmation as well as consider approving a common victual license and entertainment license. Chair Longton, a motion to open the public hearing. So move. Second. second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President voting. That's unanimous. So the public hearing is open. I'm going to continue the public hearing so we can keep on with this discussion, but, um, but that's been open now. So back to this. Do you have any more questions? No, I don't. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Can I do a quick follow-on? So we've been talking about Legacy Farm and the plan for 10 years now, uh, way back when we approved uh, the Legacy at town meeting or the concept plan at town meeting and with when we passed on purchasing the land itself, we had all kinds of conceptual plans. Has a sidewalk always been in the mix in the discussion over the years for that particular stretch of road? 
I think it was. Pedestrian accommodations have always been a big part of this plan because of the sheer number of new people that are going to be living there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is, uh, I'll, uh, for next, I'll invite Mr. McDowell up to, to talk about the, his, the project. Then, do we have, how many folks here would like to speak to this? How many, uh, three or four hands? All right. So we'll, we'll try to let it, we'll try to get as many folks in, if we, it, although I ask that we'll try to keep it relatively short. We've we got a number of letters already that the board's read. we got some more this afternoon. So, Rory, do you have anything you want to say to this? Sure. Please. Good evening, Roy McDowell representing Legacy Farms. Um, I want to clarify a few issues. So yes, the sidewalk in fact was part of the original agreement on the master plan special permit, as was the widening of Cedar Street for lane turning traffic. Now, the number 117 trees is correct, but it's a little deceiving. It's about 70 trees on Rafferty, and the remaining trees are actually on Cedar. Now, of all those trees, I think about 10 of them are of significant size, meaning 24-inch caliber or larger, and about 9 or 10 of them. The remaining number of trees are anywhere from 4 to 6 to 8, 10, 12-inch caliber, so they're smaller trees. And there will still be a canopy granted a little further back from the street. Um, it isn't simple, to, if even feasible, to move the sidewalk back for a number of reasons. One is all the property behind the sidewalk is owned by Eversource. Now, we approached Eversource over a year ago asking if, in fact, there was a possibility of putting the sidewalk further back because in a perfect world, would it look nicer further back? I couldn't disagree with that at all. Functionally, pragmatically, it does not work for a number of reasons. One being it's Eversource's property. Eversource, in fact, did give us an easement to allow us to do some grading towards and on their property, but not to put the sidewalk itself. There was concerns about having a public access sidewalk on private property, and they were very much reticent to doing that. The other issue is, if you look at Rafferty Road, going down both sides of Rafferty Road is a drainage swale, almost tight up against the road, in some instances 18, 24 inches away. Our proposal, is working with uh, Beta Group and our engineers from uh, Vanessa Hagen, <coughs> is to actually enhance the drainage along the edge of the road and enhance the drainage where the sidewalk is going. Now, earlier plans, if you were to push the sidewalk further back, in fact, the tree warden is correct, you'd be taking down somewhere between two and 300 trees. But you have other issues. You'd be encroaching into wetlands. Uh, you would have some grading issues because not only do we have to deal with the five-foot width of a sidewalk for ADA compliance, but we also have to deal with grade issues for ADA compliance. So we can't meander up and down hills and rolls and dales. We can't do that. So you have a situation where you've got a street, a drainage swale, a sidewalk, and then transitioning back to the woods. So unfortunately, uh, moving it back some significant distance really wouldn't work uh, functionally and uh, legally. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions after everyone speaks. But uh, I think the amount of trees that we've, believe me, we don't want to cut down one tree more than necessary. And I'm very comfortable with, as we lay this thing out, if someone from the planning board and the DPW and, of course, the tree warden were to look at it in advance of cutting the trees down. And if there's one, two, three, or ten, or whatever number of trees that could be saved, I'm all for it. So I have no problem with that, as long as it's a clear and concise three individuals, if you will, who can come out and make a decision on the spot. Because once we start cutting trees, we don't want to be, gee, let's go back and think about this one. Let's go back. You're gonna, you understand that. So I think, I think that's a good idea. Um, and I'm hoping to hear some ideas this evening. And I'd love to respond to them if I could after the fact. OK. Anybody have any Any questions, questions? Mr. McDowell while we're here? Questions? Questions? OK. Thank you, Roy. I appreciate thank it. Um, actually, Roy, before you go, I have one question. This is not quite the trees. What are you going to do with the telephone poles that run down the street? I mean, we the do telephone not... poles will stay as they are. So are, you, are we going to have the, just like we do everywhere else in town, with these telephone <laughs> poles and all the side? That's a large much, you know, we're we going to have telephone no, actually, poles on no, the that's, sidewalks? I, that's actually not the case. Okay. What you're going to have is you're going to have a 22-foot road. You'll have a, a strip, I'll call it two to three feet, which the poles will happen to be in. Like a little grass buffer and, kind of thing? Well, it can either be grass or gravel. I think Whatever. The latest, yeah. I think the latest version that they want gravel. Okay. And then you'll have the sidewalks. The poles will not be in the sidewalk. 
So the, okay, so let me just say what I think I heard. So the road, the road gets widened probably several feet than it looks like from the picture. Only about a foot and a half. A foot and a half. So it gets closer to those poles, and then you got a buffer of how, how wide is the buffer? It varies. In some instances, it'll be a berm up against the edge of the road, and then the sidewalk. Other instances, it'll be two to three feet. Okay, and then and then the sidewalks after that. So when we look at these pictures, the the trees you're cutting aren't the ones. Well, I guess they are. They're from the they're from the existing road all the way back. That extra, that's why I have to cut so far back. I guess I well, just realized. Well, it varies. If if you look at some places from the edge of road, let's say the trees are back three or four feet, pick a number. Yeah. Then some instances of cutting the trees back like five feet, feet, six feet, eight yeah. feet. Some instances ten feet. Yeah. It varies because there are some areas where it's not just the sidewalk, but because the sidewalk is going to be raised, you've got to transition the grade back down a natural grade okay. so those trees wouldn't survive. Got it. How wide is the sidewalk? Five feet. Oh, good. I like that. Okay. All right. Any other questions from Mr. McDowell? It's almost as wide as the road. Seriously. Okay. <laughs> so what I'd like to do now is invite members of the public to come up. Um, uh, rules are uh, come up to the podium, name and address, please. Um, I'd ask you to keep your comments to, to two minutes. We try to do it, so please, if you sent a letter to the board, if you want to summarize it, that's great, but I'd ask you not to read the whole thing. Um, and then if you have questions, obviously you can ask those as well. But, but um, we have a lot of folks. I'd like to make sure we can get everyone to speak. So if we can just try to follow those rules, that'd be very helpful. Who would like to go first? <clears throat> right. Everybody was eager a little while ago. Sort of <laughs> intimidated, okay, good, okay. Mavis is always later. Mavis O'Leary, 11 Curtis Road. Um, I, had a, I have a couple of questions. Well, I was one of those people who wrote a letter in opposition to having all these trees cut down. Um, since I've lived in Hopkinton for over 50 years and have very much come to appreciate the presence of trees, especially around my neighborhood, and now in the last uh, eight or nine years, I live next to Legacy Farm South, and it has been a drastic, um, rude awakening to see all the trees, um, both young and old, that have been taken down there to accommodate a new development. And I certainly would not want that to happen in this area that we're talking about tonight, Wilson Street and Rafferty Road. <coughs> that was one of the reasons for my letter of opposition. Um, one question I have tonight, or two, I have two questions. I wondered if the trees that are marked to come down can be remarked since the road has been, uh, the width of the road has been decreased by the planning board's actions last night. In other words, how wide was the road that they used, or I guess they used, excuse me, maybe a 24 foot wide roadway to mark those trees that will come down? And could we? think about remarking the trees now that we know the width of the road. Maybe there'll be a few more saved. Uh, the other issue is I keep hearing um, various names for the, the sidewalk. Is it a walking path as the master plan special permit refers to, or is it a sidewalk as we know it yeah. at, in our uptown areas or on, in town? Okay. Those are my questions. Good. So uh, can one of you answer them, or should I get Mr. McDowell to answer them? Roy. Okay, over to you. So Roy, the two questions at hand are, um, do we need to remark all the trees, and what's, is it going to be a sidewalk or a path? We actually don't need to remark them because the plans that we submitted were for a 22-foot road. Okay. And those are the ones we asked the planning board to approve. Okay. Um, the so the markings are accurate. The markings are accurate. They won't go any further or any closer. Yes. Okay. And then, um, uh, is a side, t tell us about this sidewalk. Is it a path or a sidewalk? I think it's semantics. Is it paved or is it dirt? It's paved. So it's an asphalt structure. So in that okay. context, one might argue it's a sidewalk. Okay. Mavis, does that answer your questions? That does answer my question. I guess in my letter I also asked <clears throat> the questions or consideration about using pervious sidewalk material, if that was the case, instead of ordinary concrete okay. or maybe asphalt. Uh, that we see on our usual sidewalks. Right. Roy, what's the story there? Um, we discussed that with the planning board. It was decided not to do that. There's a number of issues with that. Okay. With drainage and with silting of sand and that kind of thing. Okay. So they, that was their desire. Okay. Good. Thank you. Next, please. I think 
Just, yes, just uh, I think from the discussion around the schools, they were discussing something about uh, the new school having something to that effect. That was also going to involve another piece of equipment for snow clearing and yeah, things like that. Scrape, you know, so. Oh yeah, it's, it's actually uh, getting the sand off of it so it's oh, not clogged. Yeah, the yeah. planning board didn't want it. Okay, who's next? Chris, Sir. Oh. Road, um, I had a couple of questions. I did send the board a list of um, questions earlier in the afternoon, um, and then I got a. Um, the letter from the planning board that was submitted, submitted to you that um, stipulated six conditions that were attached to the proposed plan that we weren't made aware of um, last night, the planning board meeting, only the one condition that they had to submit in that uh, EPA plan. Um, my concern all, of, all along on this project is to minimise the impact. And the way it's presented right now is that there's only one alternative, and that is an asphalt sidewalk. Um, in order to meet APA requirements and, and reduce the loss of trees, um, accepting even the route of the path right now, or the walking path or the sidewalk, whatever you want to call it, um, if you accept that route, the least impact on the trees, which is what we're looking for, is to use an alternate material and not an asphalt. Because once you put the asphalt down, you have to consider the uh, intrusion of the tree roots around it and adjacent to it. Now, the town's concern for long-term maintenance, I believe, should not overwhelm the townspeople's need mm. to save the trees. So I believe that there's a viable alternative with respect to the material used on the trail or the walking path or the sidewalk. There really is, despite what Roy says. There's ADA options. There's uh, options in terms of grades. That he could put in uh, platforms every 30 feet to hold to the necessary grade. Uh, an alternate trail material would give you uh, the option to lessen the width of the sidewalk in places where there's an existing condition, be it a tree in this case, as stated in my letter. So I believe there should be a concerted effort to address the needs of the town people, townspeople, as well as the needs of the town as a government entity and the developer as the financially interested part. He's just trying to comply with an idea that was presented years ago within the context of the master plan. It doesn't mean that it's the only option. Mm -hmm. And I think an alternate option should be approach and I think it should be explored. Right. Okay. That's my opinion. Thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. Um, I have some questions regarding the sidewalk. Uh, it seems like a sidewalk to nowhere, so I'm kind of concerned about is the town going to be responsible for maintaining the sidewalk once it is put in? Um, and it was mentioned that the sidewalk was being put in for pedestrian safety. If the Bay Path Humane Society were not going to be there, would we still want the sidewalk there? Because I understand that they're considering moving. So I guess my first question is, is the town going to be responsible for maintaining the sidewalk once it is built? Okay. Elaine, can you, who owns the, who's responsible for the sidewalk once they finish it? It's within the right of way of the town. Immediately? When it's completed. When it's completed, thank you. So we have that added cost of having to maintain the sidewalk that seems to be going nowhere. There are many roads in town that have businesses and homes and things on them that could benefit by sidewalks that we, you know, the town could maintain rather than putting the sidewalk out in the middle of nowhere right now uh, for the sake of walking dogs. Now, I have nothing against the dogs and the Humane Society. It's a wonderful organization. I want the people there to be safe. But there might be some alternatives to that instead of building this sidewalk. So that's why I'm raising the concern. I am glad to hear, because I attended the planning board meeting last night, I am glad to hear that there will be some supervision to see if we can minimize the amount of trees that are being taken down. I am concerned overall in the last couple of years and going forward, more and more of our trees and our natural uh, beauty in Hopkinton is disappearing, not only from development but from disease. 
And so we are going to lose many, many more trees in the, in the future years, and I ask you to reconsider and make sure that the DPW, the planning board, and the tree warden will absolutely look at these trees again and report back to you how many they can be saved before any cutting and any work starts. And then reconsider the sidewalk, because I think it's something at this point in time, um, it's not necessary. We don't need it, or at least consider the proposal to do something other than the way it's being proposed to be built now. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Next. Tom Smith, 22 Walker Street. Um, I just want to bring up a couple points. If you look up the road right now, you'll see on the right-hand side that it's pretty clear when you get halfway up the road, the trees are smaller. And that was done a number of years ago by Tennessee Gas. They sprayed defoliant there and killed off all the elm trees. The town made them replant that area. So they're all um, young trees that are there. Why isn't the south side of the street being considered instead of the north side where it's all mature trees? The second point is it is a, right now it's a, walkway to nowhere, and I, it's an expense the town really ch just for the plowing, what it's going to cost to keep the thing plowed. The street width has got to be a little bit wider, but truck traffic cannot use that road and come down as a bypass and take a right. They can't go down 85 because of the bridge. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to bypass the center of town to use this road. So traffic considerations there, I think it's going to be uh, car traffic is going to be increased. But again, the south side of the street looks like it's a more normal way to do it because the the trees are less mature. They could be cut. It could be widened back. It's not going to make a difference in the canopy. The majority of the canopy is on the left-hand side of the road where they're going to take all these trees down. Now, like he said, there's, most of the trees are within five to eight feet of the side of the road, but I saw about six of them marked that are back 25, 30 feet, and I couldn't understand why they're going to be taken. These are mature elm trees. And years ago, this road, um, the, game, the tree warden went after Tennessee Gas because they destroyed some of the oldest elms in town and the ones that hadn't been diseased yet and created that beautiful canopy. Okay. So it's coming back, the canopy, but the right-hand side of the road is still immature. They could be cut down. I know there's ledge. That's probably why they don't want to go all the way down the road with the, with the sidewalk on that side, but that's something to consider too. Okay. Roy, why the north, not the south, and why the trees 25 feet back? All good questions. Okay, on this, first off, it was a determination made by the planning board years ago that the sidewalk would be on the north side. I had nothing to do with that decision. There are significant constraints on the south side. There's a drainage swale that goes the entire length of that, which is very important for runoff. As far as tagging further back, those are actually wetlands flags, and there are pink flags. There's a number of flags out there that had nothing to do with us. I think those were put in by Eversource. So those flags have nothing to do with us. Now, understand that we... Legacy Farms is not a proponent of doing this. This is an obligation that's been put upon us by the planning board to do two things before we can open the north side of Legacy. One is to widen the road, put in the sidewalk, and widen Cedar Street. Mm -hmm. Now, if for some reason you said to me, gee, widen the Cedar and widen the road, forget the sidewalk, obviously we're fine with that. That's not, that's not our call. So just for clarity though, Roy, there's nothing more than whatever it is, 10 feet back from the road you're cutting? Like any, anything back beyond that spurious? No. No, okay. was it 10 feet, 2 inches? I don't know. Yeah, you know it's what I'm saying, but you're not feet. going 20 feet back like the Absolutely gentleman was not. worried about. Is the colored markers that are on the trees are going to be cut. There's one color. And there's, I think there's four or five trees that are back almost 25 feet that have those same color tags on well, all the other tags. Are different. I don't know what those are. Okay. Again, again if, if, if you choose to let us go forward, I think that's a wise idea, and frankly, we like the idea between the tree warden, DPW, and if, if need be, someone from the planning board, yeah. walks the entire length of the road and Cedar Street, and we come to a mutual agreement why certain trees possibly can stay, why the rest of the trees have to go yeah. before we cut the trees down. Okay. We're fine with that. Okay. Elaine, can you answer the gentleman's question about why the north and not the south? And then also, do you know anything about these mysterious trees that are way back in the woods? I don't know anything about the mysterious trees. Okay. Um, I recall that the discussion at the meetings regarding the, the other side was the, uh, the drainage uh, gully that's so there and where the stormwater is and the proximity of wetlands. And just to address the nowhere uh, comment, very soon that's going to be somewhere. At town meeting this past May, um, it was voted to allow 180 more age-restricted units there, and they're going to be right at Wilson Street and Legacy Farms North. So very soon there's going to be, within the next couple of years, a lot of people living there yeah. that aren't there today. Okay. Anyone else would like to come up with a question? 
Sir, you got a follow on? If is it, I just want to make sure everyone else gets one first chance. So, does anybody else want to come up first before I go to second rounds? Unless it was a follow on. Was it a follow on? Yeah, it was a follow on. Oh, go ahead. Finish up. Finish up. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, when I said a sidewalk to nowhere, where is it going from there? It oh, I don't, I don't want to get into a debate about no, that. No, I just, I just okay. want to know that they say it's going to be going somewhere. It won't be used beyond 85 because you'll never see sidewalks come up 85 because of the swamp down there, the filling of the swamp to do it, and they'll never get to the center of the town that way. They may go down Just saying it's going to end at 85 is your point. It's right, it's going to end at 85. You can't even go to the park from there because the bridge at the reservoir prevents walking beyond that. So I that, think we can stipulate we all agree to that. Okay. So. Good evening, I'm Matt Zedek at 16 Wilson Street. I'd like to echo many of the uh, previous comments offered by the members of the public from around town. One other uh, thing that was uh, brought uh, or should be brought to everybody's attention, I believe, is a little history regarding tree cutting up in that neck of the woods. Uh, this spring, at the very close to the intersection of Rafferty and on Wilson Street, it looked like there was some apparent uh, trees cut down in inappropriately because that area of Wilson Street is a scenic road. Um, I know some investigations were done um, about who was the responsible party so that the appropriate actions in our scenic bylaw could be uh, taken and enforcements uh, uh, taken as a result of that. Uh, at the planning board meeting last night, a uh, question was raised whether that had ever been resolved. It sounded like it still has not been. That's, that's neither here nor there. Can, you, can we stick to the topic, which is the cutting issue trees is on cutting Rafferty trees, Road? And I'm yeah. talking about the fact that there's Road a history the of cutting right. trees. I don't care about the history. The I care about the trees are going to cut going forward on Rafferty Road. Keep so it to the topic. Since, since what has been discussed tonight involves a number of parties being uh, asked to be responsible for the appropriate cutting of trees along Rafferty Road, I would hope that since there's a history of those several of those parties already with regarding recent trees being cut on a scenic road in the same area, I would hope that some further due diligence would be done relative to those actions before similar parties are now put in charge of this particular project. Thank okay. you for your consideration. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I don't think you need to. I, I think you're fine. Um, anybody else from the public? Okay. Does anyone on the board have any questions for, you know, or uh, follow-ups from anything, any of the public comments? So, uh, so through the chair, it so, uh, sounds to me like, uh, yeah, I do have a couple of questions. So, so one would be um, how we verify that, that there's, uh, what the actual number of trees that we're concerned about here is, right? Because it sounds like some people are thinking trees further back might be subject to cutting. Sounds like Roy's clarified that that's not the case. So now maybe instead of talking about 10 old growth trees, we're talking about two or three. And then I guess my other question would be is if there's a possibility to just go around some of these larger trees and further reduce uh, the number that need to be impacted. Do we have the ability to even do this? I mean, we, we just have to approve the tree cutting, right? We can't change the route. The planning board approved the route, right? We can stipulate how the trees get cut. I agree with that. I'm just saying if the trees get cut, if we're assuming a different path when we cut the trees, we can't, we can't change the sidewalk direction. We no, we can, I don't yeah, think yeah. we can change the plan. We can, we can talk about the process by which they will identify and cut the individual trees. Agreed with that part. Yeah. Okay, right. So, but I mean, my, all I'm trying to say is that the sidewalk, the road and the sidewalk in our context are a given. That's not yes. for us to deliberate. Is that right. for discussion right. outside the hearing though? So what? Just the plan and how we move forward. Um, well, again, if we're not, if it, it goes to whether or not we let them cut the trees. Well, so, so if we don't like the plan, we don't. But we make but we make yeah. that decision outside of public hearing. The hearing is just for the public to be heard. Well, this is, right. Hearing. This isn't a pub. This isn't a posted public hearing. Okay, so we don't have I'm to, sorry. We, we, right. we didn't yeah, no, right. have to yeah. open it. We don't have to close okay. it. This is just the, the opportunity for the for folks to say their piece. So we act. There was no. I'm running it like it's public hearing, but there's no formal yeah. public so, hearing process here. Yeah, so I guess, I guess my comment on all that is, yeah, there have been suggestions about having, uh, you know, a few people who are knowledgeable about the ramifications and who will have, uh, in my preference, uh, the town's best interest at heart being part of that process of making the decisions, what trees can and can't get cut. Um, I, I do agree that it can't be something that, Everything goes out and gets remarked, and then something comes back to us, and we get a new number, and we get pictures of this tree and pictures of that tree, and maybe we can save this one, but not that one. You know, this has to be this has to be something where progress is allowed. Um, and with all of that, I guess I'm just going to throw it on the table that I have no problem with 
approving moving forward like that um, for tree removal that's necessary for the widening of the road and then eliminate the sidewalk. Um, I, I, I fail to see a purpose of the sidewalk, at least at this point, and you know, maybe, maybe uh, the trails group, uh, maybe they have some other plans or at least some type of a, a straw man that says, yeah, you know, we're probably 18 months away from needing a sidewalk there to connect everything together. But you know, to the point of uh, some of the some of the speakers earlier, and, and you know what I was saying earlier, uh, for for there to be destinations for a sidewalk, you know, uh, to get people from point A to point B, there can't just be a point A. There's got to be a point B. Um, just otherwise, like otherwise we're going down the, the route more of a trail, you know, for people just to walk along and enjoy themselves. So can I, before I go to you, Roy, can I just ask Elaine or maybe Peter if you want to talk from the Trails Committee perspective, is there a plan for this to tie in? Is there going to be a point B someday for this? Well, it do does tie into the other two and a half miles of walks on Legacy Farms Road itself. You'll be able to walk from uh, the edge of Route 85 all the way to Clinton Street. Right, but the point is you can't park there on Route 85, right? So there's no way to get, to get going. Well, you can actually, I think you can park down the boat dock area or the boat, whatever it's called, area. The one in back of the, of yeah. the, the, the dog pound there. Okay. Um, does that answer anything? But is there, does, it, does it ever tie into anything, any trails going forward? I mean, around to, to the gentleman's comment from earlier? Well, there's a whole trail system on, on the north side if of Legacy. If you want to come to the microphone after Roy's done, you can go ahead, Roy. You, you can finish. There's a whole trail system on the north side of Legacy. Is this going to be completed soon, trails on the south side? And I don't know what the trails committees are planning elsewhere in town. Okay. You know, my, my concern is we don't want to get between a rock and a hard place. If, if you say, gee, widen the road and don't cut the trees, then we got to be careful because then the planning board, if they don't agree with that, we're between a rock and a hard place because it's a requirement of ours. So what I would ask you to do is consider approving this, allowing us to meet with tree warden, DPW, and a representative of the planning board, mm -hmm. choose certain trees. Believe me, if there's a tree to be saved, it just only saves us some money. I have no ulterior motive to cut down a tree that doesn't need to be cut down. And I'm more than happy to work with that. The concern I have is, number one, we don't want to get stuck in that vortex of, gee, what about this tree? Let's talk about that tree. You know, where do you go with that? The other concern I have is if, in fact, you don't want to do the sidewalk, then I'd ask you to defer that decision to see if the planning board is willing to even entertain that, right. you know, whether it's now or five years from now, because if they're not, then we have a real problem. Yeah, that's not really our decision. So do we, th this may not be an answerable question, and, and sorry, Todd, do you want to keep going or can I? Do you have any sense of, of are the, is, is it mostly, are the trees going to be cut mostly for the road or mostly for the sidewalk, or is it just sort of, you know, they're kind of everywhere, so you just got to. no trees to cut for the road. So you can do the road without cutting any without trees. Without cutting a tree down. Okay. So the, road, the tree kind is entirely for the sidewalk. Well, not if we're doing, not doing the sidewalk. Just for the road itself, Elaine, is what I was asking. Elaine brought up a point. She said, well, gee, if, if, you st if you don't do the sidewalk, but we require you to still do the storm water, which I'm not sure why we would, but let's say we did, there may be a few trees, but it wouldn't be a lot. Okay, but nothing, de minimis. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? So, so through the chair, I never got my question asked, and I'm looping that back to uh, where it says here, the planning board tree warden may approve field modifications in order to retain trees during construction. And so I'm just asking if there's someone here familiar with some of these trees where maybe the sidewalk could just go around a, a few of them. Again, I, we, I think the proper way to approach this is we'd, we'd be on site with a plan, with a tree warden, DPW, whomever. And frankly, I don't care if a neighbor's even there. We can look at them and say, gee, if we twist the walk. Now, the concern I have is as long as the planning board is willing to live with a few twists and turns, and oh, by the way, CONCOM is willing to live with a few twists and turns without starting the whole process all over again, I'm fine with that, but I'm just concerned that you yeah. can't get overly creative without yeah. violating our own plans. Okay, so let's see if let's see if we can bring this to a conclusion here of some sort. So here's the state of play: the planning board wants the road widened and the sidewalk built. The planning board has approved that, and it requires an, a, a, an, an, an amount of tree cutting. This has come to the board of selectmen purely as a tree cutting issue, not as a approve the road or the sidewalk issue. Although I guess de facto, if we don't let them cut trees, they can't do anything. So so we sort of a little bit of a veto here if we want, but. 
but fundamentally changing the, the route here is not within our purview. So the, I think the question for the board is, do we want to, um, uh, it, focusing on the tree cutting element, do we want to let them just go ahead? Do we want to let them go ahead with conditions? Do we want to just say no and effectively kick this whole thing off to a discussion, but then that puts Roy in limbo? Mr. Herr, over to you. One last question, if I could, please, to the planning director. Please. Lane, on a scale of 1 to 10, how strongly does the planning board want this sidewalk to go in? It's hard to say. I mean, they, they are requiring it in the special permit. They required it for a number of years now. Uh, they thought it was really important based on the testimony that was provided during that two-year public hearing process. Sounds like a nine to it's me. It's important. Okay. So with that sort of steadfast position from the mm -hmm. planning board, I think we should really focus in on what we can do to manage the process to save as many trees as possible without disrupting what the planning board is pretty strong about. I think that's really the question before us tonight. Right. Uh, so I would encourage us to nail a hard process for the management of the tree cutting tonight okay. Okay. so that people can go off and do their work without sort of reinventing the whole wheel. Because when, if we try to back out of the, the whole concept of the sidewalk Collapse. or change that sidewalk's route yeah. measurably, I think we're opening up a huge can of worms. Okay, and so I want to go to Mr. Mosier, but just to lay out the state of play, the, the current planning board approval requires the planning board or tree warden um, be available, I guess, to approve modifications to retain trees, but that doesn't really sort of take away the issue of having a, having a bias toward not cutting trees, if at all possible. And they also want the DPW to be there to supervise the work. So that's what's been asked for by the planning board. Clearly, we can ask for something else. With, with that, Mr. Mosier, anything? Uh, yeah, so through the chair, I, I agree with Mr. Herr that, that we, could, we can lay out a process, I think, that will emphasize the attempt to preserve trees. Um, but I'm wondering if we could do this contingent upon or, or maybe ask the planning board to take a look at the need for this sidewalk and, and maybe, maybe a bike lane would be more appropriate for the community now. So that special permit was done how long ago, Elaine? It was 2010. 2000, okay, so that's, that's more recent than I thought. Um, so, so that, that's my thinking. We could give them the go-ahead, but just ask them to take another look and make sure that this is, this is the best option for the community. Okay, so your idea is approval with some level of contingencies, but also, also with a request for one last look by Correct. the planning board. Okay, so that's one concept. Do we have any, I mean, I, I think what I would be interested in talking about would be, um, given that this has come to us and that our responsibility is to, is to, to focus on the trees, to try to enhance the planning board's approval with something under our control about making sure that the trees, again, there's a bias towards not cutting trees where possible as opposed to what the planning board did, which is sort of have people available in case they want to change it, but not having that built-in um, preference to protect trees, particularly large trees. Little things I, I think you don't worry about as much, mm -hmm. but the big ones that are sort of old, old-ish growth you'd like to maintain. So one option would be we could, we could just reinforce the fact we want the DPW there and we give them a charge to, to focus especially on maybe p trees of particular size, larger trees, and to, and to try to work to find solutions to avoid taking down those trees if it's possible. Because I think those are the ones that have the greatest impact on the canopy and, and everything else that folks are worried about. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that as a pathway forward to this. I would just say, with respect to your comments and Mr. Mosier's suggestion, first of all, I like Mr. Mosier's suggestion. Um, with respect to your comments, it certainly wouldn't be the first time uh, if, if we were to vote against cutting any trees, it wouldn't be the first time a political organization asserted its authority in an indirect way to get what it wants uh, for something that is outside of its authority. Um, I don't intend on, I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to do that because the planning board is there for a reason, and they're the ones who look at this stuff from you know one week to the next. Uh, but I do like Mr. Mosier's suggestion uh, to uh, vote on this, and if it passes, have there be contingencies set. And I think that that contingency should be for the planning board to revisit the need for a sidewalk. Uh, and I think that there should be um, that that part of that contingency should be that there is a formal vote by the planning board on whether or not uh, it's, it's a sidewalk or something, some variation of a sidewalk. Okay, so the, the bid, the ask the, here is that we take a vote 
on a motion that would that would be to I gather to approve the cutting, maybe with some requirements of oversight made mm -hmm. by the DPW. Absolutely, absolutely. But then, right, to, with, again, to, with a focus on protecting larger trees, and your point is also that we asked the planning board to, to review this project, I guess, what, one more time, in, in basically, um, and whether they actually think they really need it. Yeah, I mean, to the point of uh, some of the speakers tonight, you know, this is, this is a plan that was done several years ago. And, um, you know, uh, Roy, Roy has been, you know, perfectly willing to keep up his end of the bargain and do this. But now people are asking for this to be revisited. And, you know, I'm included. I, you know, I look at this and I just don't, I don't see the sense in it. You know, it gets you to the edge of, it gets you to the edge of the park and you get there and you can't go any further into the park, really. So, I'm sorry to speak up. I'll let it go. Go ahead. I mean, can you back it up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So come to the podium. Yep, name and address. Uh, just like everyone else, Robert. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to mention uh, you can do a search on hopnews.com. Uh, <laughs> product oh, placement God. is not allowed. <laughs> uh, uh, to see photos of the state park, and especially in this area. I'll tell you, old people, from what I understand, like to fish um, with their grandchildren and so forth. Um, there are going to be a lot of uh, older type people, uh, 180 families living at that part of Legacy Farms. Um, the state park is indeed very accessible. It's accessible in, at the end of that sidewalk that once it, you want to build. Uh, it's going to be accessible for fishing, for boating, uh, for wildlife watching. There's a lot of wildlife down there, photography. And so that's simply an awful lot to do down there. Uh, and it would be it would be kind of tragic that people would move into that environment and not have that beautiful resource. Oh, I certainly I certainly knew that you could get there and you could get to the water's edge. Um, I I am just uneducated uh, of any paths from there to get around the. Park. Oh no, it goes all the way around. Uh, okay. Up to the up to, up to the Ashland water plant, at which time you can take a 200 foot walk down the road to get to the edge of the shore or on the other side of the Ashland water plant. Or you could wade if you wanted in uh, two feet of water. Or when the water is really low, you can walk along the gravel shore mm -hmm. and go all the way around the park uh, to the dam. So um, there's just an awful lot. Uh, we're talking about that path, uh, that sidewalk would lead to the small boat landing uh, also, which uh, people from Legacy could drive down. Uh, they could uh, walk down to that. Yeah, the, um, yeah. There's, there's no question that the boat. You know, I wasn't questioning yeah. that the boat landing was accessible, but I don't see people pulling their boats I'm down the sidewalk to, to get there. there. Well, no, that that wouldn't happen. Um, I would. We kept just the, we the back. And, okay, too much back and forth. Too much okay, back and just, forth. Okay, uh, just to some, it, it's a great resource, and yes, you can walk the shore, uh, perhaps for a half mile, before you reach the uh, water um, treatment plant. Good. Thank you, Robert. Okay. So just to try to move this along, unless anybody has any comments. I mean, Cheryl, how about, let's construct a motion here. Um, a motion uh, to uh, approve the tree cutting plan as proposed by Legacy with the condition that the DPW um, is, uh, is responsible for the, to the Board of Selectmen for focusing on the tree cutting element here, particularly on the larger trees, by which I mean greater than 12 inches in diameter and with a preference toward retaining those wherever possible, okay? Um, uh, and then uh, also contingent upon a request to the planning board that they review this plan one last time and determine that they strongly believe there to be a, need, a public need for this sidewalk. How does that sound as a concept of a motion? Um, can we replace a uh, request with a vote of the planning board? Uh, you can do whatever you want. I mean, again, our, our, our ability to compel them is, is, is non-existent. But we can certainly, you can certainly put it in. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. no, it's okay. just contingent on that. So contingent on vote of the planning board, reaffirming that, reaffirming their desire for the project. How's that? I'll just, can I, I'll, I'll come to you where I promise. Does that make sense? Inside the motion, I would like to replace the DPW with the DPW director. Thank you. I'd okay, like there Westerling we go. Mr. Westerling personally to be involved in this and make okay. that decision so we've got some accountability somewhere. Okay. Uh, I also think we should add 
another individual to that walk process and approval process. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like it to be a citizen of the town, if possible, without opening another can of worms about who that might be. I'd like Peter Legoy sitting in the off of the audience here to do something like that. I think he'd do a great job. Somebody along those lines on the trails. I mean, if you won't go, I'll go. I mean, I'll, I'll do, I can do a one-time walk. I don't, or or right. if you want to do yeah, it, something like fine. that. I think, if, I think a, an individual taxpayer, citizen of the town would be part of the process, should okay. be part of the process. Okay. So the motion as, as being created, do you have anything? And we're making progress, so. No, yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I, I would just like to, if you could, you mentioned yeah. the DPW director. I, I just want to make sure you include the tree warden in that. The playing board's already asked him so to be involved. Already, yeah. Okay. So, I, that's, uh, so the, he's already in, that, he's in yeah. the process. Right. Thank you. I, I would just hope that if you do have a citizen attend, and I, I'm fine with that, I mean, it's it's open process, I just want to make sure at the end of the day the decisions should rest in the hands of the DPW director and the tree warden. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Um, just to speak to that for a second, Peter Leroy, 21 Hayden Row. This is a similar process to what we did when we put the center trail in, so, and I'd certainly be willing to help out with that. Okay, so you can do it? be real similar, and we can move it through pretty quickly with the planning board ultimately being the decision makers. Okay. So do you, want, do you want to be Peter specifically, or how do you want to do it? I think you did an excellent job with the center trail, so I think okay. it would be a All right, so the motion it. the chair will entertain here is as follows. The, the board approved the, um, the tree crudding request submitted. Um, uh, by legacy, actually not by legacy. Uh, the, the board approved the, the tree, tree cutting request subject to um, oversight by the DPW director um, prior to cutting of any trees larger than 12 inches in diameter, let's say. Does that make sense, Peter, by the way? Yeah. Larger, you know, meaningful trees, right? Um, uh, assisted by Peter Legoy, and that uh, furthermore that the um, uh, this be subject to the approval be subject to the planning board taking an additional vote uh, uh, in favor of this sidewalk proposal. Yes, sir. Um, can we can we phrase it rather than I, I'm I'm just concerned with our authority to uh, name a citizen to this group that's making a decision without. Opening something up okay, to find out who's the board, interested. The chairman of the board of selectmen or a designee. How's that? That's fine. Good. I'm good. <laughs> who's your designee? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, so those appointments are in addition to the planning board's tree warden, and um, I think that needs to be part and, of the motion uh, too. So there's no. Well, they already put it. It's a con yeah, it's contingent sorry. there thing. Yeah. We don't, I mean, I, don't okay. think, I think that's. So there's four individuals. There's the DPW director. There's the chairman of the board of selectmen's designee. The planning board and the tree warden. Planning board, tree board representative, representative right. and the tree warden. Correct. Right. That foursome is going to go walk, and I'm sure Mr. McDowell would like to tag along and make sure that everybody's on the Mr. same page. Mr. Herr, are you okay with an even number? I'm okay yeah. with an even number in this case because okay. I'm convinced they'll work it out. <laughs> so that's the motion. Chair will entertain uh, a, a motion of that nature. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Do we have any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present, not voting. That's unanimous. Okay, so that's how we're going to do this. What did we agree to? Exactly. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. All right. So, so are we getting pepperoni on this or not? We're going to Good. <laughs> Too late. It's done back to the case. public meeting now, right? Oh, yeah, I was going to. But I, but I do have a, the public hearing already open. I need to get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was my plan. Thank you, though. Okay, so we're going to return to the continued public hearing for Hocken and Spoon and Wine Malt License. Uh, the, we opened this hearing 45 minutes ago. Do we have the proponent handy? All right, how many trees do you all want to cut? Kidding. Um, okay, thank you for coming in. If you please introduce yourselves and tell us what you hope to do, and, and uh, we'll go right to it. William Morgan, um, owner of Golden Spoon, uh, formerly Golden Spoon, now reopening as The Spoon. Uh, Samantha Prescott, co-owner of The Spoon. Can you speak up because you, you got a lot of noise in uh, back here? Formerly right known as The Golden Spoon. Right on. Okay. Welcome. Um, we are here to apply for a wine and malt liquor um, license. Okay. Uh, we 
both worked, uh, Bill was a manager and for 10 years of the previous Golden Spoon, and then later um, an owner for four years. I worked there for nine years. Uh, many of my family members have worked at the restaurant. Um, we are here to apply for the wine and malt liquor, um, mostly to focus on our Friday night dinners that we were planning on having, as well as uh, maybe some lunches that we will have um, throughout the week. And mostly looking towards having it for the Friday night dinners to pair meals with wine and beer. Wonderful. I'm glad you're here. Uh, let's go over and start off Mr. Sistari. Um, first of all, I'm happy to hear that you're coming back to town. Thank you. So, um, with that, uh, I guess I haven't even uh, looked to see what's the location that you're going to be at. Uh, One Lumber Street. One Lumber? Yep. Great. Um, do you have, uh, is there any date in mind for opening, reopening? I'm hoping for the 1st of March. 1st mm -hmm. of March? Great. Um, how about, what's, March 1st, so. what's the size of the space going to be? Uh, it's 1896 square feet. And how many seats? Uh, we're looking for about 62 seats. 62 Maximum seats. Maximum is at 65. It's going to be similar, identical uh, in terms of menu and general fare? Correct. Right. Uh, breakfast, lunch, uh, seven days a week, and then we'll do a Friday night dinner. Okay, great. Well, uh, again, welcome back and, and uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Mr. Herr. I'm chewing my Oh, I'm sorry. You want to come back? No. Um, so did I hear that you're going to be a co-owner of this new facility? Correct. So will this be your first uh, venture down the ownership path? Correct. Good for yes. you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, was there a liquor license uh, at the Spoon previously? Yep. It was beer and wine. It was beer and wine, and it was typically that Friday evening thing you were doing. Uh, and ha what happened to that license? Um, when we were closing, I let it expire at the end of last year. So that came back into inventory for us, and we still have at that license, Mr. Kamalo, Mr. Helen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and during the time that you had that license, I think I know the answer, but I ask obvious questions for, I think, obvious reasons. Uh, were there any incidents with that license? No. Uh, at the Golden Spoon? No, nope. never an incident. Um, I think the police department had people come in from time to time, you know, spot checks. And never, never a problem. We will never admit if they do that or not. Um, I'm good, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mosier. Uh, just a um, question for Mr. Kamal. There's a comment here by the police chief on the serving times. Unfortunately, I can't open the application right now to see if, if that was corrected. Um, so I want to see how the police chief's comments were or were not addressed. And what those are, just so you all know, is that the beverage license times are listed as 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. 5 a.m. seems a little early to start yeah. hitting it. So, um, so his proposal is um, noon. The full, the hours okay. of operation that we had, but okay. we don't have to serve. At 5 a.m. Yeah, I think the previous yeah. license was uh, 11, uh, after 11 a.m. Yeah. A.m., okay. Uh, Sir? To be clear, I believe the police chief's concern was related to the saving time for alcohol, and not necessarily the closing time for the research. No, I know. That's what, yeah, I think we all understood that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll follow the regu regulations for. Okay. Um, we get to approve the hours for this, right? So we can just, we can just, I, I don't know that we'll go for 5 a.m., um, but, um, uh, but, you know, noon is probably reasonable. So, okay. I'm good. You're good? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Catino. Yeah, so 5 a.m. would probably work in New York City. Right. <laughs> it's going on for me after hours. Now, I, I'm just really glad to hear that uh, you, you're coming back. Congratulations. Thank you. He's, he seems like a very good partner. Um, yeah, I have, uh, I have no, other, no other questions that haven't been asked already. Okay, good. Uh, application seems in order. Do we have any, are the applications all set? No, 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 no issues, mistakes, errors, things you had to add? Yes, the application was reviewed by staff as well as town council and no further issues were raised. It's all in our order. Okay, it looks clean. And you, now you have, neither of you have records we have to deal with or anything. Okay. Do we have any members of the public or butters or anyone else who'd like to make any comments? 
Okay, seeing none. Uh, Chairman, so yes, before sir. Before we close, if we could. So, who will be the manager of record? I am. Who will be the manager of record? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and have you done the TIP certification and all that Correct. other stuff? Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Chairman, I entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, President Bowen. It's unanimous. Um, now the chair, the board deliberates. Does anyone have any um, comments, questions, uh, you know, think, items for the board as we think about whether to approve this license? Um, should there always be somebody who's TIPS certified uh, on premise? Yes. We, we will have um, Bill and I both, and then uh, anyone who is serving alcohol at that time will be TIPS certified. Okay, great. I think that's a requirement now, right? Yeah. Mass law. Yeah, yeah that's mass law. I think the only question we, the, uh, you know, at least from my perspective, uh, is the, the 5 a.m. thing. We should think about just making sure we define whatever hours we want to be open. So uh, I would just suggest doing it the same as the hours they had in the previous license. Do we know what those were? I think um, you stated. Yeah, yeah not, not before 11 a.m. So yeah. 11, uh, you're. Uh, right. Okay. Victor's license uh, was till 9, so. Is that including Sunday as well? The 11 a.m.? Was it seven yeah, days? It was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So their previous license was seven days, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And that's what they're asking for here. Okay. Does anyone else have any, does anyone have any other questions or anything? So should, can we just talk for a minute about the density of licenses in that area of town now? Certainly. Um, not that I'm opposed, but just to get it out there. So we have um, uh, the Chinese restaurant. We have pending uh, the 110 10 grill. LLC, whatever that name of that is, sorry. Uh, we have this. Yep. Uh, do we anticipate any others coming in that space or in that area? The, these are restaurants, so, I mean, you know, it's not like, it's not like we're clustering a bunch of bars together or something like that. You know, this is, this is where the primary business is being a restaurant. So I, I understand the question, and it, you know it's a perfectly valid question, but and, and so it's also wine and malt, which is again you know sort of a lesser. And many on the town boards, if I may do the chair, many of the town boards were uh, accused of uh, chasing the golden spoon away. And I'm just uh, I think it's good that we're welcoming the uh, return back to its original form. I haven't had a bacon, egg, and cheese since they left, so I'm all for them coming back. <laughs> I'm down for an omelet. Well, okay. Plenty ready for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, just, to con just to understand. I don't know that I know of any others. I mean, in that area, that would be coming. So through the chair, I think it's, there's only, it's only one additional. The 110 the grill 110 would be the one additional. Is the new one, right. The other two were right. pre-existing. They were already from here. Yeah. And then the other one was from right. the inventory from previous Golden Spoon. Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Starbucks going to apply for one. Just, <laughs> just a matter of time. <laughs> um, Shots. <laughs> okay, so the uh, the chair will um, entertain a motion to approve the application for Section 12 Wine and Malt Only Restaurant License for Hopkins and Spoon Incorporated to forward to the ABCC for their affirmation, um, subject to the hours of service being limited to. What's wrong, Mr. Kamal? Just want to clear this amendment. Did the order to close the criteria? A while yes. ago. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking, though. Uh, subject to the hours of operation being limited, service, the hours of alcohol service being limited to 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week. So moved. Second. Okay. Any questions? Further discussion on this topic? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. Good. Thank Congratulations you. on that. So that was we also need to give them, go ahead. That was no wine and license. malt license, correct? Right. So there's also a, a question to approve a common victualler and entertainment license. I do not have any further information on that. Can we ask, uh, do we need anything more from them on the common victual? Do we, I don't know nothing about the entertainment license that's being requested. Yeah. Um, there was nothing in the package about that, so. For the entertainment, excuse me, did you apply for the entertainment license? Well? Um, just for um, common victual? recorded music over a speaker. Just for recorded music over a speaker. Yes. Not live do we, music. Was it in the, is it in the pack? I didn't see it. Yeah, it's yeah. A, the entertainment part? Yeah, it's yeah. I didn't see that either. 
Yeah. No, no wonder I went right past it. Okay. I go right to the criminal record stuff. Okay. And then, um, possibly one t television. Goodness, <laughs> I trust you, I don't see it. Oh, oh, it's that bottom line. One television and recorded music to be included. Okay. Okay, so that's the part, of the, that's the part that's entertainment license. Mm -hmm. okay. A separate vote? Yeah, I think we need to approve the common picture alert separately and then the entertainment license separately as well. Is that right, Mr. Kamala? That is correct. Okay. So, so Mr. Chair, I'm just, get, maybe I'm getting tired here. So we had, we had uh, motions in front of us this evening for a wine and malt. We also had a motion in front of us for all alcohol. It was one or the other, correct? No, they were only asking wine and malt. Correct. Yeah. So they were asking for wine and malt. We got a sample motion for a, all alcohol just in case. Is that why this is here? No, that's one. That's for 110. That's for they 110. want all alcohol. Thank you very much. Yep. Now I understand what's going on. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for, for the applicants about the common victory license? Okay. Uh, Chair, I want to take a motion to approve a common victory license Some for the Golden Hopping Second. Department. Okay. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That's also unanimous. Now we have an entertainment license which requests one television and, re and a recorded music. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions for the applicant about that? Yeah, yes, through, sir. Through the chair, recorded music would be in, in the restaurant only. I don't know if there's an outdoor seating area. Restaurant only. There's okay. no outdoor seating. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Channel 10 a motion to approve an entertainment license for the Hopkins and Spoon Incorporated. Mm -hmm. Second. Uh, so motion and a second for the discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye opposed. Present not voting. That's also unanimous. Okay, you're all set. Thank you. Thank you all for coming in. Good luck. Looking forward to coming over. Thank See you soon. All right, I'm going to skip down now to, uh, since we're on a roll here with public hearings, I'm going to skip down to item 11, which is continued posted public hearing for 110 Grill LS Hopkins LS, Hopkins and LLC. It's an action item. Proponents 110 Grill LS, Hopkins and LLC. Man, there's too many L's here. DBA 110 Grill, location 77 West Main Street, Hopkins and Mass. The board will consider a public hearing to consider approval of an application for a Section 12 all alcohol license and petition for a change of license, a pledge of license in stock or stock for 77 West Main Street, Hopkinton, LLC, and forward to the ABCC for their affirmation, as well as consider approving a common victual license and entertainment license. Okay, so uh, to rehash, these folks were in a few weeks ago. We had a couple of um, uh, administrative items that had to be addressed. I think they went off and, and addressed them. Um, or we'll find out if that's true in a minute here. So they went off and, and came back with, with a re su supplemental materials that are part of the application. I should also comment on the fact that tonight um, the board met an executive session to discuss the character of one of the applications uh, associated with the application, and the board did determine that the individual is, is of sufficient character and fitness to be part of the application. Sir, over to you. Tell us what you did in, since we last saw Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, Attorney Kevin Erickson, on behalf of the applicant, uh, since the last time uh, that we met, we did provide an uh, unredacted uh, loan commitment letter. We made a, um, a correction to uh, one section of the license application, which was, uh, uh, had a typographical error, a, um, a mistranscription. Okay. Um, and we've provided that information uh, to the board through the, the town manager's office, and um, I, I believe that that addresses the, uh, the outstanding items uh, from the last time that we were here. Okay. Do uh, Mr. Mosier, you, you, do you have any questions for the applicant? I do not, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Catino. Um, yeah, I, if I, I'm trying to find again what the, the hours of operations and just make sure that we, we just did it the last one. We are uh, 11 a.m. to... 1 a.m. Wow. <laughs> 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. Is, is the ask here. Anything else, John? What, else? No, what, um, what are some of the other restaurants? What, what do we have around town? We actually let a lot of them open to 1 a.m., it turns out. Um, Dynasty, I don't know if that's 1 a.m., but the one up the Co. is 1 a.m. Um, but I think there was some discussion, just to, not to cause trouble, but just to reiterate, you know, on the board, there was some question on the board's mind last night about whether that's an appropriate time given the location of the, the building. Mr. Kamal, do you have something to add to that? Just to affirm against the condoms, it's called in the All have 1 a.m. Okay. What about Quattro? Mm -hmm. Quattro's midnight. They're what? Midnight, he said. Midnight, yeah, that's right. So 
So uh, just to clarify for the board too, we ask for this in all of our locations. It's not to say that every night we stay open until 1 a.m. Part of the trouble is um, you can't necessarily plan for special events, holidays. New Year's Eve falls on a different day uh, every year. Um, you know, we might have, we do a lot of functions. So we may have a retirement party on a particular evening, or we may have um, uh, a rehearsal dinner on another evening. And so logistically speaking, we always ask for 1 a.m. We don't stay open till 1 a.m. every night, 365 days out of the year, because it doesn't make economic sense for us to do that. Okay, thank you for that. I'm okay. Mr. Sistari, I'll stop. Mr. Merger, I went just, just uh, the entertainment we discussed last time. Right. The hours of the outdoor entertainment. Outdoor music and all. So when we, when we talk about live entertainment, it's, our brand is um, such that we're an, we're an upscale American grill. So it's, it's a very subdued live entertainment. It's acoustic uh, guitar player, uh, perhaps. Um, and certainly we're required to meet any noise ordinance that you have. Um, so typically, though, um, you know, during the, the winter months, obviously, the, that patio is seasonal, so uh, that live entertainment's uh, indoors. But um, during the summer months, we do on occasion have uh, live entertainment outside, and that's normally, um, you know, Thursday, Friday. Um, but on, on certain occasions, again, if there's a function or if there's, um, you know, a special promotion, then we'll do live entertainment in our locations in Nashua um, as well as Chelmsford. And it works out quite well. And uh, we haven't had any complaints or violations. Okay. Thank you for that. Anything else? No, I'm good. Okay. Mr. Herr. So uh, inside for entertainment, beyond the live entertainment, what will take place? Or what, are you we have, what we've applied for is uh, recorded music. Uh, we have a serious, a commercial serious uh, a subscription in all of our locations, so there'll be uh, some recorded music through that means, uh, as well as televisions. Um, we don't do any dancing or things of that nature, so that's what it is. It's televisions, it's recorded music. So television, sports, things like that. That's right. Okay. I'm good, thank you. Okay. Um, on the application, how many TVs do you plan to have in the place? It, it says, it asks a number and you just put an X. We have five TVs. Five. All in the bar area? Yeah, they're all in the bar area. Okay. So is this kind of a standard layout, set out, like, you know, um, Fit out like is this look like is this do you have a kind of a standard layout on the restaurants? Is I, yes, Robert Walker for the record. Um, it is uh, typically again the the shape and size of the facility is a little bit different, but yeah. there are certain prototypical events that we have at all our restaurants. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do I have any other questions? Rhine Development LLC is, the, is, some, is an entity that actually occupies it, it, it says? Is that no, we took that off. We, we've uh, supplemented that. Oh, so that's uh, the that's supplemental the, one. Yes. Okay, so I'm looking at the old package it looks like. That's correct. Okay. So I just want to make sure it's all makes sense. Mr. Chair, while you're looking there, the manager of record will be? Uh, Ryan Dion, which we mentioned uh, at, at the last hearing. He's our... Uh, Chief Operating Officer. So and he'll be on the site routinely. That's correct. Everyone's TIP certified. All everyone right. is TIP certified. Okay. okay. I'm good. Um, does anybody else have any questions for the applicant? You're not going to come back and ask for Kino, are you? No, we are not. We have nothing against Please Kino. We're on. not. That's not our business model. Okay. Um, Mr. Kamal, just to, if uh, we're not deliberating yet, but. The hours they ask for, if we go for it, can we change those hours at some later time if we decide to? That is hard. Just sort of, we can just do it. Give the boss discretion. Yeah. The board would have to call a meeting. Yeah, I get that part. Yeah, I'm not, okay, I'm not going to call. Okay. Uh, do we have any members of the public who'd like to be heard? Any butters? Any, any interested parties? Anyone all who wants to speak about this application? Chief, please, sir, come on down. Sorry, I'm only making uh, the comments now, but I just want to be concerned about Really residential now, but when the views 
Susie DeVille in Los Alamo carried back there and has been on me dealing with noise complaints. So do you mean for use of it or for the music or just, uh, or in, you know, you know. Just the outdoor uh, the team, for the dog player. The music and all. You'd like to see stop at 10 or 11. Okay. 10, I guess. Okay. That's the Chief's in inputs. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, anything else for the applicant before I close? So do we need to do anything with the, with the to implement the Chief's input? Well, we can do the deliberation phase. Right now, we're just in the information yeah. gathering okay. phase. Could I suggest uh, to the Chief's comment that uh, 11 p.m. may be uh, an inappropriate time that we could certainly uh, live with? And then again, at the Board's discretion, if that's not working out, then there's always the opportunity to revisit that. Again, is that something else we can control unilaterally? Yes. Okay. Okay. And also, um, at the time of getting the license, the Board can do this. Right. But we could also do it in the interim. If in six months there were people complaining, yes. we could. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Chair, I want to take a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present, not voting. That's unanimous. Public hearing is closed. The board now deliberates. Does anyone have uh, any comments they want to make to the board about um, this license and whether we should approve it or not? Right. Sorry, I'll go ahead. To start first. I was just going to say, generally, you know, I, I'm in favor of approving uh, the license, um, even prior to the chief coming up. But, but certainly, um, uh, I want to support the chief as well. <clears throat> I do think that the outdoor entertainment. I think 10 o'clock is a reasonable place to start. Um, you know, if uh, and I would I would put the onus on the business that uh, if they find that 10 o'clock is is Proving difficult, uh, then then you know they can always make another request uh, at a renewal time or something of that nature. Okay, so your your desire is for a ten o'clock, no more outdoor activities. Um, entertainment. Um, entertainment. So you yeah. can seating outside. Yeah, they can still have the seating. No uh, music after ten. Yeah. Okay. Would we address that in the liquor license or in the that would be in the entertainment license, right? What's before us tonight? Are they all before us, like we just did with the spoon? Yeah, common victual or liquor, common victual and entertainment. Okay, so let's. But it's outdoor entertainment. So outdoor, outdoor entertainment obviously falls. I just want to make sure it obviously seems to fall into entertainment. Okay, okay. So we could. So that's one question. Um, on the, to the liquor license, do we have any the alcohol license? Do we have any questions? To I, that? I have no further question? questions on the liquor okay. license. You good, Mister? On the liquor license, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, so the chair will a motion to approve um, a Section 12 all alcohol license and petition for change of license for 77 West Main, Hopkinton, LLC to forward to the ABCC for their affirmation. So moved. Mr. Chair, I believe it was for 110 Grill LS, Hopkinton, LLC. What did I say? Oh. The 110 Grill LS, um, the Hopkinton, LLC. And the only other the comment that I would oh, make. Oh, yeah, the agenda's wrong. You're right. Red 77 okay. Mango. Yeah, is yeah. that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one Lumber Street is the address of the property, which had not been assigned, I think, when we submitted. Right. So. So through the, through the chair, I'll make a revised motion. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll withdraw. I'll move that the board approve a Section 12 all, all alcohol license for 110 Grill LS Hoppington LLC. And I'll change to a second. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. Do we have any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. Okay, the liquor license is set. Um, now we need to go for a common victory license. Does anyone have any questions for the applicant about the common victory license? Mr. Kamal, is there anything we should know about the common picture of our license? At this point, uh, there are no other issues that uh, have come up. Okay, so Chair will entertain a motion to approve a common picture of license for 110 Grill LS Hopkins LLC. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That's unanimous. So the common picture of license is all set. Final the entertainment license. Um, the ask here again is for all hours, right, till 1 a.m. basically. That's we correct. A, we, have a, we have a request for a 10 o'clock no outdoor entertainment time. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on or comments on that? I, I would agree with that. Okay. So challenge a motion to approve an entertainment license subject to outdoor entertainment being limited to, um, to uh, terminating at 10 p.m. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further comments on that? Are you good with that, Mr. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's 10 o'clock outdoor, 1 o'clock indoor? Correct. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't touching the indoor part. Okay. I mean, the, the closing hours or anything. Mm -hmm. And again, we can always amend this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're good. 
Further comments? Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, present, not voting. That's approved as well. I think you're all set. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, guys. Okay, let's go back now to item nine on our woefully delayed schedule tonight. Fiscal year 17 revenue projections. A discussion item. The town manager will provide a preliminary fiscal year 2017 revenue projection. The school committee and appropriations committee are invited to participate. Welcome, Mr. Mayor and the school committee. Ms. Kamal, you want to just dive right into it? Please. Um, in, in your packet, I included the cover memo, the financial model, uh, one five years out, as well as uh, the text impact spreadsheet, and uh, the last year's uh, budget policy statement that was uh, put together and recommended by the board. Um, in terms of the five-year financial forecast, I wanted to highlight the board that, uh, as we've said in the past years, uh, at this point, the financial model is still uh, well in progress. Uh, we hope to be refining and adjusting our forecast as the budget process unfolds. Uh, the key highlights under the revenue side assumptions uh, include the following. Uh, we are projecting that local revenue uh, coming into the town in FY17 will be less than uh, what we uh, projected for FY16, approximately uh, 43,000. We are projecting state aid to be flat for the entire period. Our new growth at this point has not been certified. We are projecting 1.4 million. Uh, I want to share with you all that, uh, you know, uh, in the outlying years, we're expecting that this number is going to have got down um, given the fact that uh, uh, the bulk of new growth is coming through the legacy funds and the news project. Uh, free cash, as we know, is now city fund. Um, based on approvals at the last special town meeting, we have approximately $2 million uh, in free cash. Um, water and sewer enterprises are assumed uh, to continue to operate at full cost recovery, uh, although as the board has discussed in prior discussions, uh, the town has to continue to review the viability of the sewer enterprise. Uh, Parking rate enterprise revenues are projected to be flat. Um, however, I should mention, uh, as the budget process unfolds, uh, we will continue reviewing the entire uh, Parking rate enterprise budget with the commissioners as well as uh, Jay, who is the director of the department. Process review in the general government subsidy um, has, uh, was recently discussed uh, between the Corporations Committee uh, and the opposition. Uh, uh, regarding expenses, uh, the model assumes the following uh, the FY17 operating expenses are preliminary at this point. They are based on submissions that are received from different departments. We project that health insurance costs are going to go up. We are working with 5.2 as uh, a projected increase. However, in my most recent discussions with our agent, uh, we have been advised that perhaps we should be planning for an 8% increase. Uh, op open obligations based on the actual valuation uh, performed by uh, the board or <coughs> by the board at uh, beginning of this year, we are estimating approximately 959,000. Uh, including a pay as equal amount of 561,000. Uh, continuing uh, on the trend established over the last three or four years, we are projecting pay as equal capital expenses at approximately $800,000. Debt service is estimated to increase slightly from approximately 4.5 million to 4.7 million. The Community Preservation Fund process is now underway. We don't have the final request numbers yet. They will be available by the end of the calendar year. Uh, snow and ice deficit, um, we are projecting approximately 688,000 uh, to go into the FY17 budget. And this number accounts for the FEMA investment that we received for the January and February snow ice storms. I also want to mention to the board that uh, departments have submitted the initial funding requests uh, for the strategic initiatives, uh, I think all the town and school teams uh, have very competitive cases that I have reviewed preliminarily. 
Um, however, we, I did not include the strategic mission numbers in the locations that we shared with you. Uh, as in prior years, uh, tax impact analysis is a key component of our review process. Uh, based on the very preliminary numbers that I presented, uh, we are projecting a tax increase of approximately 12.97% uh, and a tax impact net of new growth of approximately 10.45%. Uh, and, and these numbers, I want to underscore this, I'm sharing these numbers purely for illustrative purposes. Uh, I also want to highlight that uh, the percentage increases that I've uh, identified assume that all of the amounts are to be raised uh, through taxation and not through available funds. Which therefore means if there was a decision going uh, through the process to apply the available free cash of 2.1 million, um, these uh, percentage impacts may drop from 9.19% 9.19% and 6.6% respectively. Uh, I also uh, want to share with the board that we are now, we are at this point, given those numbers, are projecting uh, a deficit of 2.9 million. Shouldn't scare the board in the sense that um, as we continue to update the financial estimates, refine the new growth estimates, apply the free cash, uh, we could find a way to reject However, based on prior year trends, uh, as we have seen, the town slash departments uh, updated projections or requests normally go up. Um, for the most part, this is a result of the couple of articles that are still are in formulation until we uh, say when we put together the budget calendar, the end of the calendar year. Uh, other considerations for the board include the following. We have uh, several unsettled labor contracts. Um, we are projecting increases in our fixed costs. We continue to feel the pressure on healthcare costs. We've tried to do a good job over the last four or five years keeping those costs down. Um, we um, have taken advantage of our awareness programs to, uh, to help in that regard. However, I think if you look across the state, everybody is projecting increases in health care costs. Pension liability or pet liability continue to be a concern for the town. Uh, and also, as we start thinking about the capital projects, it's important that at least the board will affirm its commitment to um, ensuring that the projects that go forward uh, are the projects that fall within the town's capital asset management plan. This may entail asking the permanent building committee to update that plan uh, before the end of the uh, process. Um, I also want to highlight that um, given um, most recent developments in town, uh, we are anticipating that there may be likely changes in, to, the, uh, to the local economy. Uh, and with this in mind, uh, I think I'll get questions from the board. Again, the numbers are very preliminary. There is information that we know. That I think to, and in fact, I should mention this. Thanks to the efforts of the finance team downstairs, Janet McKay, Maureen Dinero, the consultant, we have to know what the application number is. Okay, thank you for that. Over to Mr. Sestari to start. <coughs> so it sounds like we shouldn't be frightened by this number. There's evidence to say that it could go down, another evidence to say that it could go up. <laughs> I wouldn't say we shouldn't be frightened. I think what I'm trying to do is to at least encourage the board to continue to take a very conservative approach mm -hmm. to the budget process. Um, going to uh, item A on the first page, um, you're projecting the local revenue down 43,000. And I apologize if you said more precisely why. You know, it says projected decrease to penalties and interest on taxes. Um, <laughs> what? How, how did that projection come about? From a planning perspective, we already take a very conservative approach, assuming that there will be more penalties and, taxes, uh, and, and interest on taxes. Um, but as the budget process unfolds, as we finalize our tax secure process, we will take a better So it's taking a conservative approach to this? And, yeah. Okay. Um, item F Park and Recreation Enterprise revenues are projected to be flat or lower than fiscal year 16 uh, with a review of general government subsidy pending. 
So um, that that enterprise, the enterprise revenues, does that include the revenues from the Fruit Street Field and its operations? The ones that are attributable to their general operating expenses, yes. However, I think as we learned most recently, I rely on projections that were done by the former finance director. We have since learned from the Park and Rec Commission that they were not familiar with that information. So this is now back to the category of working progress. Okay, you, you, you kind of segmented that though. You said something about the revenues that are subject to the enterprise fund. Can you just, are, when, when they're renting the fields, does that money go into the enterprise fund or not? My understanding is that under the current agreement, uh, there are funds, there are different buckets uh, that were identified for distributing the income from this relationship mm -hmm. between the town and hoping to live so. Okay. There are funds that come to the town, there are funds that are retained by hoping to live so, uh, pending subject to uh, independent review of those accounts by either party. <coughs> That's what I was referring to, i.e. the funds that come straight to the town, the funds that are retained by hoping to live so. Okay. I, I'm still really not clear on, on what that means. When, I, when, when we start taking into account that town meeting just approved another building um, based on the premise that this was going to be increasing in revenues and, and that that enterprise fund, is this the enterprise fund that's expected to pay for the new buildings down there? Based on the discussions and the voted town meeting, I believe the general fund will be paying for the borrowing costs associated with the new building. It's not going to be the enterprise fund paying for the borrowing costs. Right, but isn't the enterprise fund supposed to reimburse the general fund for, for that borrow on, on a spread out basis, more like a mortgage? In other cases, the town did discuss that issue, but that particular point we are raising was not raised in relation to this project. Okay. Doesn't look like it's going to be able to if, if that was the assumption. Um, the health insurance costs, uh, you're saying estimated to increase 5.2 percent. Um, our broker is saying probably more in the area of 8 percent. Do we shop that out every year, not only, not only uh, looking at different carriers and getting quotes from different carriers, but different, having different brokers um, get, get quotes? and also compare the different brokers to the GIC or something like that. When was the last time we did that, I guess? Because um, I know we have done that in the past. Yeah, um, I, I always make it a practice to at least competitively beat the entire package uh, every three years. Mm -hmm. um, we have not looked into the option of using different uh, agents or brokers uh, okay. to compile different um, codes for the town. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Herr. So we have a lot to do here, it appears. Um, but I'm a little confused in the backside here, Mr. Kamalo. So we're talking about if we use the free cash, we'd be at 9.19 and 6.67% respectively of tax impact and new growth, uh, and net of new growth at 6.67. And then you want to talk about... FY budget request, the town faces a 2.9 million deficit. So is that 2.9 million deficit the 6.67 percent, or is that above and beyond the 6.6? So we raise tax to 6.67, then we still have a 2.9 million dollar deficit. I'm confused. Yeah, no, the 2.9 is calculated based on the first set of numbers, the 12.97 and the 2.5%. Okay, so we'd have to if we to to fill in what what we're thinking people are asking for now, what we're thinking we need now. We need to go up 10.45 percent preliminarily. Yes. Okay. So that can't happen. I mean, that's just an outrageous number that will never fly, right? And we'll send thousands of people packing. So I don't want to be the drama queen here, but we just can't even go there. I mean, this is not going to fly. Um, and that number builds into some of the assumptions that are on the front side here, uh, including the OPEB and uh, pay-as-you-go capital and some other things. So, so we're very early in the budget process. We're not raising anyone's taxes 10% this year. At least I, I would never vote to do that. 
but we're very early on in the process and we've got to sort through a lot of stuff to find a number that's manageable. My personal opinion is, uh, besides all this good work that you've done and I, with, with Chris joining the team and, and, and the others, I think will be a great shape for our budget presentations in the spring. But my personal feeling is we have been on a spending spree like we have never been on before. We're still coming out of an economic situation that is not fully recovered, I don't think, nationally, statewide, or locally, regionally, locally either. Um, while I think we have the capacity to, con to invest in the town, we have made those decisions already with the land acquisitions, the schools, the library, the DPW facility, the new roof on the one school. I can't think of what else we need. So with that, I think we all need to drive a car an extra year longer. I think we need to take the fire truck out another year beyond what we normally would. I think we need to shut it down for a couple years till we get our footing under us financially going forward. We want to maintain excellent schools. We want to maintain excellent services. But the assets that add up to a couple million dollars a year and pay as you go and this other stuff, well, I need it because that's what we do. I want that to end. We've just spent $60 million, I think, roughly, in the last seven months. And we have got to shut it down because the 10% tax increase is, frankly, extremely unfair to the taxpayers of Hopkinton. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mosher. I'd like to thank Norman for uh, the work he did putting together these reports, um, particularly in the absence of a full-time financial director. Uh, a couple of quick questions, Norman, <clears throat> on your fiscal 2016 budget message. I just want to understand items one and two. One, more directed spending on the core mission and frontline services. And number two, maintain level funding for current municipal service operations while keeping costs as low as possible. That's actually last year's message. We're going to do the new, new year's, the next year's message oh, okay. um, as part of, this, oh. part of the follow-on discussion. So what that, that's including the packet for consideration about what we might want to make the message be this year. Okay, great. So that was easy. Um, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> so the next point, uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Sestari's point a little bit about parks and rec. Well, just about the numbers in general. I guess before I get really worried about the numbers, I want to see what Chris has to say. You know, once you have uh, uh, some more resources to go through this and get a little better feel for, for what's going on. But I would definitely uh, like to get a, an accurate answer on the town's liability around the Fruit Street Fields. To finally have an answer, what's in that enterprise fund? What is the HYSA going to contribute? And where are we, you know, are we, are we secure or are we dollars short for when we have to replace that field? So I'd really like to have a, uh, a final answer on that as well as the other enterprise fund and then have a real discussion about what our future needs may or may not be and and how much we may or may not need to subsidize or I guess fund uh, the other enterprise funds and just briefly to mr. Hur's point about our spending spree a lot of that spending was was also over things that were deferred for a long time to try to minimize impact to the taxpayers but it's just kind of like anything repairs on your house never come at a good time and when you have to do the roof and the boiler at the same time it it's kind of ugly on the monthly bill so I you know I don't know you know as far as shutting it down I think we, we as a board should you know take a look at it what the costs are that we our contractual obligations are and then go from there I'm good. You good? Yeah. Mr. Catino. Yeah, I just really appreciate that uh, you wrote this up so that even an engineer can understand it. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it really is straightforward, but uh, the, the numbers in the back are just uh, extremely frightening. To, to Mr. Hur's point, um, we, uh, I, I'm, I'm more on the end of uh, I'm shutting down a little bit and, and really it, it's it just make an extra hurdle before we before we buy anything and or agree to um, new hires, new, just like you said, new fire trucks, new police cars, new vehicles for, for town hall, anything. We've just really got to look at it. The new growth, where, would, where, you at, where is it estimated coming from? Uh, it's, it's, that number comes from the projects that are already approved. Uh, 
Um, we always adjust that number as pipeline projects get approved. In terms of process, we are at the tail end of certifying our new goal estimate, and we should have a much more precise number by the time this budget process concludes. Yeah, because it's just that 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 ten percent, twelve percent, that would frighten uh, a lot of people in town. So we have to be careful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what the plan was was to go through the revenue projections, ask questions ask appropriations and school committee if they let them do it and then we're going to shift directly into the next item on the agenda which is the budget message which which can reflect all this so this was just meant to give us all time to sort of ask questions first can i go to the appropriations committee do you all have any questions comments about the financial projections presented by the town manager i'm still just, okay aghast okay yeah we just saw this this afternoon we're kind of losing after <laughs> some first time too um, but again, um, you see the $2.9 million deficit, but I also, I, I realize you're doing this for illustrative purposes. And you that are we moving towards the structural deficit in the operating budget? Because we're not always going to have this free cash every year. But if you do, for this year, if you do apply about $2 million towards the free cash, now you're down to 900000 I also noted or noticed that for OPEC, you know, this year, I think uh, there was a presentation that somehow somewhere between 350, 400,000 per year over next year would get us on track. And I see in the budget for 2017, you have 1.2 million dollars. I don't know what the need is for that. I know I see you kind of put some of the operational budget and some of the cash for that. But is there, you know, there's a lot to work with. And, and so at first I was, I freaked out when I saw $2.9 million. And I, when I go start looking at the numbers, there's a lot of options, at least for this year. There's definitely a warning for future years that we're not going to have this every year. So I'm not sure if you have any comment on that right now, especially on the old head, like which I'm not familiar with. Uh, I'm for putting the right amount in to keep us on track. Yeah, uh, in fact, to that point, uh, through the actual evaluation performed by um, uh, uh, Dan Sherman, we have much more precise numbers as to what the town should contribute. I just want to make sure that you are looking at the correct version of the memo. Uh, for FY17, um, we have identified 959,282. That includes the pay is equal amount of 561,328, which means the, the pay is equal commitment relative to active retirees is the 561, and the remainder of that amount is around, I think, 390,000 or 8,000 to 400,000 is what we pay towards our future liabilities. Mm -hmm. And that number, in fact, is, is in the same range as what we just approved at home meeting for FY7, FY16. Through the chairman, but uh, yeah, looking at the spreadsheet itself, first I saw your message, but in the spreadsheet where you do the calculations. I mean, that's just a lot to work with. So. Yeah. Okay. Do we in the school committee have any questions or sure. comments? Um, kind of like can, can you come? Can you? Because sure. they want to get you on the camera. We want this to be recorded for the ages. Mm -hmm. Is it really about the backup materials that were provided to not the summary statement? You have the school, you have requested, and the school committee has yet to request a budget. So I didn't know where that number came from. Um, I don't think we've come to you with a budget request for 2017. And I, if I look at it, the percentage is about 4%. And so I didn't know where that came from and what the expect, what that's telling us. Again, uh, the numbers are very preliminary. That based on. Uh, off the cuff discussions with the superintendent and the business manager, and then it is purely for illustrative and, 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 and planning purposes. The, I do agree with you, the school committee has not submitted a request. Perhaps we should read high that column as preliminary discussion numbers. So, through the chair, um, what other rows in that column are also preliminary and they're not actual requests. And I only ask because I look at what's there for school committee and it's 4%. And then I look at public works and it's like almost 16%. And I look at general government and it's 7.6%.
So were th are those requests that have already come in, or is that an assessment that you've made ahead of time? And for what reason? Yeah, yeah here's what we did. Um, I think one of the comments we received at the last year for the process was the need for us to reach out prior to this discussion to the department of <coughs> CPA. What we see in back from the numbers that I received from the CPA. Okay. They are not their final budget submissions. So we're, but you're, at least as of right now, expecting Public Works to come in and ask for about 16% and General Government to come in and ask for 7.5%. Not necessarily. This is okay. for planning purposes. Okay. Um, and then I guess my last question, and this might just be for information purposes as we go forward, um, is there, can you um, allocate or at least tell us the percentage so let's say it is 4% for this year, and I can't remember the exact percent for last year. 4.8. But we talk about it in a town meeting. We show this pie that says this is, you know, the portion that goes to the school, right? And it looks like a very large percentage of the town budget. But I actually think that if you compare that pie chart year after year after year, the piece of pie that's going to the school is becoming less and less and less. And so can you track that and can you give us that information going into this budget season? Okay, great, thanks. You're not gonna, okay. Do you have something, Mr. Mosier? No, I'm good. I mean, generally we do the budget based on the, uh, not on the graphic input yeah, right. specifically. Okay. All right, so, uh, right, so I think the key points here to make are this is super early. There's a lot of assumptions baked in. We all need to take a deep breath there. We knew this was going to be a tight year coming out of the underride. Um, this, in fact, was always forecast to be the worst year, um, where, in fact, we always thought we'd be short money. So it's going to be challenging, but, um, but I, I'm comfortable we'll make this work out to something reasonable. This, this, um, there's a lot of levers we can work on here. There's things we can certainly defer. Um, this, you know, it's, it's keep calm and carry on kind of thing, kind of, kind of thing. We'll, we'll make this work. Um, but that is a convenient segue into the FY17 budget policy statement, which is item number 10 on the agenda tonight. The town manager will propose an annual budget policy statement to the Board of Selectmen for approval. The School Committee and Appropriations Committee will also continue you to be invited to participate. So, um, so what we have here in the packet is uh, last year's budget policy statement. And um, I so aptly pointed out. Thank you, Mr. Mosier, for, for your preview, your helpful preview of the document. My pleasure. And then um, always one step ahead of the rest of the world, always. as usual. As usual. <laughs> and uh, what we want to do now is um, to try to adhere as close as we can to the budget calendar, which is the last set of documents in the package, and put out a budget policy statement um, to, um, to help department heads uh, and others consider how to put their budgets together and what for ask for. So, um, Ms. Kamalo, I guess we could use the fiscal year 2014 as a template. Do you have anything you want to start off with um, to help the board think about this? Um, yes, I can just go down the list of the questions and the questions and answers to Mr. Moja send a question. Uh, I can send you the message to all the department members uh, that their budgets should focus on the goals and objectives that are identified in just a few months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Certainly one option this year would be the question of, well, you're sort of saying the same thing, level service versus, right, um, versus maybe not quite level service in this year. Um, so we may want to think about that um, as an alternative. Okay. Uh, does anyone on the board um, wish to make any comments about what, the, what they think the budget message should entail? I think what I heard was was tighten up spending, right? Um, control this. Um, now again, just though making a distinction between the capital items we've bought and the operational items, right? So we we, we spent a lot on structures, uh, land, stuff like that. Um, which obviously doesn't, the operational budget doesn't have much influence on that. So I think the question is, what do we want, does anyone have any thoughts about what we want, may tell, may tell department heads and others to think about what their operational budgets, and the capital items they might want to buy. But again, in the scheme of things, that's not a, typically a large number. 
Well, I'd start. Uh, I'd Mr. start. Mosher, I'd sure. start with level funding. Okay. <laughs> that that's where I would start. But just to the to the board, while we're trying to contain costs, we have to be careful that we don't go down a road we've gone in the past where we defer maintenance mm -hmm. items. Right. We we all worked really hard to put this capital maintenance plan in place, and we need to stick to it. Um, as we go through this budget, though, I'd like to find out what, what the costs are that we can avoid contractual obligation increases, health care cost increases, and kind of start with the conversation around those and then, and then back our way into any optional spending within the other departments. Mm -hmm. Mr. Catino? Uh, no, nothing at this time. Okay. Mr. Har. Well, I think I... Said my piece a few minutes ago. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I really struggle with department heads that, in my view, don't understand the impact on taxpayers. And while we can sit here and talk operational costs and capital costs and CPC costs and this cost and that cost, and we get all that, the average taxpayer gets a bill and they open it up and they go, OMG, what am I going to do this quarter? That's what a lot of people do, and they, all this other stuff is just stuff to them. And I think it's really disrespectful when somebody throws out these outrageous numbers of what they think they're going to need to make their operation work for the next fiscal year. And it just really frustrates me, so I'll stop now. Okay. Over to Mr. Zistari. Um Yeah, I mean, I think we all know the position that we're in right now. And, uh, you know, to, to your point, Mr. Chairman, I think that we all knew that we were headed here. Uh, when we made some of the decisions we made last year and, and the years prior. Um, it's, it is time to tighten the belt a bit. And while this message is in particular for the operational budget, we do need to take into consideration everything that was outside the operational budget that has been approved over the last year. Um, Mr. Mosier mentioned earlier that you know, a lot of this was, or some of it anyway, was, you know, paying for our actions of the past where we're tightening the belt and we're foregoing maintenance to future dates, and that's true. Some of it was. And other components are also uh, due to uh, the board and the town trying to plan for the future as well and make sure that uh, we're not getting ourselves into a, a pinch in the future whether it's, you know, uh, with respect to land for schools or other maintenance items. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, we're at a point now where we're looking at, um, you know, the, the possibility, uh, because all these numbers are just projections, you know, the possibility of some big numbers coming down for this year and uh, the certainty that in the next couple of years, there are going to be numbers outside the operational budget that are going to be providing a spike to everyone's tax bills. Uh, so we need, to, we need to approach this gingerly, and we need to understand across all departments that uh, when we're adding things to the operational budget, um, nine times out of ten, if not more, those are items that are sticking in that operational budget year over year. Um, it's, it's very seldom that we're seeing these, uh, the, the operational budgets, whether it's on the town side or the school side or whether we want to break it down into individual departments, it's very seldom that we're seeing those numbers coming down from one year to the next. Uh, but we certainly need to start making some adjustments and uh, bringing them as, as close to flat as possible over the next year or two. Okay. Appropriations, any thoughts the board should take into account as we think about a message? I absolutely agree with what has been mentioned by the Board of Selectmen. I agree. Um, we have to keep in mind how even outside the operational budget, we did have the, or inside the operational budget, we did have the underwrite a couple of years ago, and I'd like to be able to not have to present uh, an override situation. I want to stay at least within where we are operationally. Um, our capital articles outside, as we showed in our special town meeting, we, we're going to have a big spike between 2018 and 2022, and I think we have to keep that in, in mind when we're looking at capital articles, too. It's going to be gaps we have to have versus do we just want it? It's nice to have. And, uh, I think it's important uh, to keep the taxpayers in mind. Okay. Schools, over to you. Any thoughts about what we should consider? Okay. 
right. So what I heard, I think, Mr. Kamal, and I'll throw this out to the board for um, for further deliberation. Um, I think I heard level service or in level funding. I'm sorry, right? This year should be the should be the target here. So we should look to we should look to um, have departments come in. What's wrong, Mr. Kamal? What don't you like? Yes, if, 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 if the board is is that clear? Could we discuss first the, the impact of level funding versus level service? Please. Um, if we went with level funding versus level service, we may see a cut in services. Understood. OK. But I think what I've heard from the board members is, though, concern about about the, the pace of growth picking up. And so we'll wind at least having an understanding of what, maybe having an understanding for the board of what we would be losing by going with level funding as opposed to level service would be, would be useful to know. I, I think what I'm learning very quickly is, granted, the town was very thoughtful uh, and deliberate in assigning the application of new growth from legacy farms. We are now at that point where the effects of that new growth, very positive effects, are now being felt in departments that were not considered. You mean the demand for services is going exactly. up? Exactly. Okay, so you're sure this is the back end of, this is the downside of the new growth. Exactly. It's beginning to show up in the town clerk's office. Mm -hmm. Uh, the treasurer collector's office and uh, other service departments here in, in Toronto. Well, <coughs> certainly why new growth is not a panacea for all the problems, right? And why building more things is not always a long, good long-term solution. But nonetheless, we do need to, I think what I heard from the board loud and clear just now and from everyone else is that they, we need to look at how to control these department spending. And so, um, I'll leave it to the board, but I think what I heard was, was they want something less than level service, probably, um, as something to consider. I also think, and it was raised by Mr. Mosher, and I couldn't agree with this more, one of the challenges in times like this is, is sticking to your asset management plan. So I think we need to revisit camp. We've talked about this. We probably need to go off and have that be done. It's been several years, and that study is certainly stale now. But we should revisit the projects on that list, but we should also stick to them because that, that's a lot of maintenance. That's a lot of other items that tend to get lost and, and times are tough. So I, I do think it's worth revisiting the, what the camp looks like, um, but at the end of the day, sticking to it. And then the third thing I, I heard I think was sort of tied to level funding, a little bit level service rather, level funding rather, is control the growth of contractual costs. We have a number of contracts coming up for negotiation this year. Um, I think it's paramount that we... Um, we impress upon all the departments the need to control the contractual growth because that, that drives a lot of these numbers very um, quickly. Yeah, and, be, and being very cognizant as well, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with the free cash, you know, it's, it's very easy and very tempting to just throw that right at the operational budget, but that doesn't help the tax bills the following year. Yeah, well, I, I, I agreed. Yeah. You'd have to believe you had a one-time hole you had to fill to do that. Okay. My Does sense anybody else is, have anything? My sense is the, 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 the budget, early as it is, the mindset around it, though, not just, not Mr. Kamala I'm saying directly, but in general in, in town is, you know, we've got this free cash free-for-all. And it seems like everyone thinks we're just loaded with cash and it's falling out of our pockets, so let's just load up and keep on going <laughs> fat and happy. And I fundamentally believe at the federal, state, and local level, governmental bodies should be starved and scraping to survive. Because if you give a bureaucracy cash more than it needs, it finds a way to spend it. So we need to fundamentally starve the system. Not starve the people, not starve the students, not starve the roads, but starve the system of cash. And I don't think that mindset exists in the <clears> town <throat> today, and I think we need to get there quickly. Mr. Mosher. So, so through the chair, I, uh, Mr. Hurry bring up an, an interesting point. And, and so just a couple of thoughts on typically we ask for strategic initiatives, right? And I'm kind of wondering if, if maybe this, this year we don't, we don't ask for that, particularly where there's a lot of new personnel coming on. Keep it simple, stabilize, 
but in the process of starving the cash, because to your point, if the money's there, if, you know, a place will be found to spend it because there's always need. We just have to be doubly careful that that we don't um, hurt ourselves in the long term, right? So I think we have spent a ton of money, but I think this board thoughtfully set the town up very well for the next 10, 20, 50 years with some of the spending that we've done. But we did that knowing it was going to be painful for the next one, two, three plus years uh, to accomplish that. So while we starve the system, we just need to make sure we're not starving it in places that are going to end up costing us down the line. Okay. So in terms of the message um, to put out, um, again, it sounds like uh, something close to level funding, something closer to level funding and level services, Mr. Kamala, is something the board has to have a conversation about this year. We have to decide really we really want to invest the extra money to maintain services at a certain level in some departments in particular. So I, I just... I think you need to have departments go forth and really talk about what they're going to lose if they if they can't do a level service budget, um, only level fund yeah level service budget. So I, I I think am I missing the consensus of the board? I think people want to see that. So we need to have that conversation. I think we need to tell them all that all their capital projects have to go through through camp and have and will only be considered if they're in camp. I think the board should set a policy this year where anything that's not in the capital asset management plan will just automatically be rejected by the board. I, I, I think we've had a number of times in the last couple of years where for good reasons things came forward, things got passed on even though they were in the asset management plan. And, I, and again, when we set this up, it was meant to drive what we did on, on programs. So I would, I would suggest respectfully that the board consider just not, a, not a, taking forward any projects that don't come through the capital asset um, plan. Um, but again, we need to we need to continue to do maintenance on things, which is a little lot of what's in camp, just to make sure we don't uh, destroy our assets if, if, if because of short term games. And then, and then I think we're all in agreement on the contractual costs with all the contracts coming this year. We have to be tight. Does anyone else have anything else I'd like to have the town manager add to the budget statement, policy statement? Do you all have any anything else you think we should look to include? Okay. Yes, Mr. Kamalo. Uh, if I may, uh, Please. In, in, in terms of the strategic initiatives, I just want to share with the board that, based on my preliminary discussions, there are very there are some very thoughtful um, service-related uh, proposals that um, I think have been generated by our very committed uh, our staff. For example, facilities department, we have two new buildings that were rolling out on the town side, library and DPW. They both will require custodial services. And Dave, working with town with his team, has identified ways of accomplishing services, which he has done, I mean savings, uh, which he has done over the last two years. And his idea is to then apply those savings towards uh, supporting the new facilities. That's one example. Mm -hmm. The other example uh, that has come up again through the efforts of the day is we've taken a look at how much the town is spending on inspectional engineering services. On time for this and approved the town meeting, we spend a substantial amount of money in that regard. Some projects we spend around 140000 some projects we spend 80000 and the idea is, could we save the town money by perhaps hiring somebody to do that, versus paying for each individual project? So that, that's just, that, that's the, 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 the tip of the iceberg. And in talking preliminary with the, with the school superintendent, uh, she has referenced uh, some thoughts of strategic initiatives uh, that she has identified that uh, will be addressing the influx of the ELL, special education students, uh, the increases in overall uh, enrollment, um, as well as uh, associated transportation costs. So these are some of the, the, the thoughts that, that are being generated. And I, I, I don't intend to get into a lengthy debate with that Mr. Head, um, but I, I, I just want to point out that I won't be that lengthy. There are some, some, some initiatives that I think 
Yeah. Well, I will say the superintendent of schools is already signaling that they're going to, are going to have some dramatic expenses in the next few years related to ELL and and a host of these other expenses with with the influx of folks coming to town. So there's she's been very clear about the fact they're going to have some mandated expenses that are sizable um, coming forth in the budget that, that we're not going to be able to do anything about. So there, there's things to look forward to on that. Um, one other thing to propose, Mr. Kamal, we put into this budget message this year. We talk about a lot about the rationale, like the economy and all those other things. We should maybe just put into Mr. Hur's point something about controlling growth of rate, you know, rate of growth of the tax rate, right? We need to we need to sort of make that explicit a concern. We need to, the town needs to continue to be a place that's livable for people of all ages, and so I do think there may be. It sounds like there may be a little more of a desire on the board's part to make sure that we're we're thinking about that as one of the key driving factors, right? The whole how it all adds up to a tax rate for people that that that's mis maintainable. Um, over time, so I would I would just put that in as a top down item, Mr. Moser. Just, yes. just to kind of that real quick, um, uh, a woman brought up at town meeting about the um, potential tax relief for seniors. I can't remember exactly what her specific statement was, but um, maybe that's something we could investigate yeah. further. Absolutely, that is correct. In fact, I I have drawn up a list of. Items that I, I think I'll be reviewing at the staff level for the process. <coughs> That's one of the items that, that I, uh, uh, I included on the list. Uh, alongside reviewing the revolving funds throughout yeah. the whole town, um, also reviewing the, the, the EMS ambulance fund in the fire department. We've met that promise for many years. Suzanne started the work. I think this is the time for us to, to finish that exercise. Okay. All right. I'd just like to make one other comment too, you know, because uh, you know we've a couple a couple of folks have, have touched on the underride that took place last year, and while the underride certainly seems to put a pinch on the numbers that we're working with, it doesn't change anything in the facts of how much money is being spent in one place or another. All it does is put a pinch on on the group of people who are in this room right now. Um, in how do we formulate a budget where we don't have to go for an override. Um, but in the end, it's still the same amount of money that, that's being spent. And, you know, it's just a matter of whether or not we go over a certain amount that now the people in town have to give a little bit more thought as well to say, do I want to spend that? Okay. Anybody else getting anything to add to the budget policy statement? Yeah, I just think, uh, if I may, that um, we just can't always just assume that uh, we're just going to spend more every single year. You know, businesses don't run like that. If they, if if uh, revenues are flat and profits are flat, you, you you do things to make up for it, and things get cut. Things things don't get bought. But uh, and I really think that we have to start looking at it. Uh, a little more pragmatically. That's it. Mr. Kamal, do you have enough to go off and, and put together the, the policy statement for the board to approve? Here's what I, I have yep. from the board. Um, we have the funding. This is starting point. Build in contractual obligations. Controlling them. Yep. Um, focus capital expenditures. Um, on the priorities established in the in the camp. Uh, and to Brian's point, uh send a very strong message that at the same time. Right. Everything must go through camp. And tax rate has to be one of the, the explicit considerations that people are, are working on. Right. Yeah. I think this is going to be a very interesting uh, conversation as we as the process and uh, I think it's, it's, as I listed earlier on uh, uh, it's clear from the, 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 the town department as well as the school team um, that there are some uh, expenditures that, that they believe strongly uh, uh, need to be part of the discussion going forward. Uh, I think the message that I heard specifically from Kathy was that in light of the influx of the ELL, special education students, the increase in enrollment, um, the increase in transportation costs, 
it is very unlikely that they'll be able to come in even if the project will focus there. I understand. I mean, again, they're they're a victim of things they can't control sometimes. So, but what they can control, they have to. Okay. Anybody else got anything else on this topic? Anybody else got anything they want to add to the budget policy message? Okay. So we'll approve this next meeting, I guess. Or are we just going to issue it based upon the conversation? Based on the conversation. Okay. Draft the statement and issue it to the department. Good. Okay. Is everyone good with that? Mm -hmm. good. Yep. Okay. Good. good. All right, matter settled. Thank you. Moving on, fire department update. The fire chief Ken Clark, who's been waiting patiently in the back, will give the board an update on issues of the fire department, including new hires. Hi, chief. Coming down to the wire. Very close. Good evening. How's everybody tonight? Yeah, we got to pick it up a little bit after that Getting last tired. conversation. Yeah, yeah. Tired. Now, now it's low. We got to pick up the energy again. No, some very exciting things happening. I wanted to update you on the, uh, on the Hopkins Public Safety Dispatch as of tomorrow. It'll have been online a week. The, uh, we're already seeing the uh, benefits of it. And I wanted to uh, thank the uh, project management team. Uh, uh, Deputy Chief Steve Slamman was the project manager. Town manager uh, was part of that. The uh, HR director, Chief Lee, Sergeant Bennett, Megan Durad. And then also a special thanks goes out to the employees in the dispatch center. They have grasped this change with great passion, dedication, uh, and every time that I've been there to, to review or watch, uh, it puts a smile on my face to see how well uh, it, it, they're doing there, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, and, and it's, a, uh, it's a big move for the community and a, and a real uh, thing, that a real efficiency for the community. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to uh, talk about very briefly was the... Uh, the staffing increase for January. We have two firefighters coming online, working with HR to fill that now, moving forward. And uh, I think the plate is set very well for my replacement when he comes in to move forward uh, and, uh, and, and to uh, make those, put those in place. It'll be after I go. I'm under 60 days now, so it's like uh, hmm. I missed the place, but it's like it is what it is. Are you bragging? What's that? Are you bragging? Not at all. No way. <laughs> Not my game plan. I don't have any game like that. So, it's like, uh, you know. But, uh, but like I said, the play is set for the new chief, and I'd like to thank the town manager and your support for some of the successes that we have seen in the last year. And thank you. Thank you. Questions for the chief, Mr. Catino? Uh, nothing at this time. Mr. Herr. We're going to talk about the replacement process in a minute, right? So it's next time on the agenda. Okay. Is he going to hang for that? If he likes, he's always welcome. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Mosier. Just a brief question on the um, Ashland Hopkins collaboration. Did we ever actually close that? That, that was kind of left open ended that we were going to get back to the MAPC on that, right? We, yeah, we closed it. We have addressed some of the administrative requirements for closing the, the, the project. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't completed that process. But overall, in terms of the actual planning and so forth, that, that, that plan is closed. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much wrapped up. Um, on the dispatch, Chief, could you give me um, just, just some example of uh, what you said there was some, you already saw some successes this week. Just, uh, just give me an example of we had uh, multiple. Uh, I think there was two today where we had multiple uh, serious motor vehicle accidents, and the in the proper number of people who were able to respond effectively and efficiently to to handle those calls. And that person that would normally be in our dispatch uh, was on the truck out in the street working, uh, patient care, getting people ready to transport, taking care of the accident. The only thing I miss is walking into dispatch and getting an update of what's going on if I don't move with him because he's now gone. Yeah. But it's like uh, uh, it was. I listened to it very closely on the radio while I'm home also, and uh, I like what I hear, and I, and, I, and I also liked what I saw today. So it's like uh, that's just two examples just today. And so that, that extra person going out, how much does that increase your efficiency? That, that gives us uh, the efficiency of 
50% of the time we have four now, and 50% of the time we have five moving on the street. Okay. Before it was three and four. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Good question. Mrs. Sistani. No questions. Um, it's just starting to hit home now, Chief, when you're saying you're inside 60 days. Um, we're going to miss you, but we still got you for 60. You do. Till midnight on the 1st. But who's counting? Okay. Thanks for coming in, Chief. Okay. So, yep. Just to be clear, um, the two positions that I've been discussed for January, I think is was stated throughout the budget process last year, these are impact positions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Got it. With, with the, with the, from driven by the data that was, we talked about the Ashland Collaborative, all that, we're using that data, and it's data driven there, and it's been, that has been, there's a, some of that project that's been very useful for us. Great. Okay. All right, so let's segue can neatly into the next topic, which is the fire chief hiring process update. The board will receive an update in the progress of the fire chief hiring. Mr. Kamalo. If I may, Mr. Moja, if you allow me to, um, specifically, I uh, have a meeting scheduled for this Thursday where we'll do the final preparations ahead of the first round of interviews scheduled for next Monday. We have also attended to the schedule. Oh, the second round of interviews for the following I thought it was just a little. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any questions from Mr. Kamalo on the hiring process? Are we still on track for midnight January 1st? <laughs> Having a new fire chief in the chair? We're working diligently towards that date. Okay. That seems to be fast so, approaching. Yeah, can we talk calendar? So yeah. you're having first round <laughs> now, right? So it's, the, so it's November 3rd. You're having first round next Monday. Then second round before Thanksgiving, I guess. Yes, second round before the Monday. And then board interviews is the final round, right? Yes. And that's... And then we proceeded uh, by an assessment center. Similar yeah, 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 right, the assessment center. So we're, so best case, the board's taking this up at our second December meeting. What's that on December 25th? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Actually, the 24th. No, 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 that's that's start Christmas. Early. We'll do it the 24th. It's the, mid, it's the annual midnight meeting. 24th, we <laughs> meet December. Midnight meeting. <laughs> um, okay. But we have to assume somebody may be in a different role. Let's say it's an outside hire. Well, right. So ain't, ain't no way the chair is being filled January 1st if we're not having the final interviews till December 20th or whatever the second board meeting is. So... Does that mean that... So but it should be quick, right? Does I that mean, mean Ben assumes the role of chief? <laughs> Give me the little red hat. Yeah, I think there. Jack Tino wants to be the chief. No, Jamie, Jamie was just jumping around the other day. <laughs> I can see John. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be the chief. Right? Well, he can't. There's no machine gun on top of the truck. He, no, he wants to be the police chief. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got to get the other <laughs> bear cat out there. So, um, okay, so we're not going to have a new chief in place by the time... It doesn't sound happens. like it. We have to be realistic. Just to be realistic. It's, it's sort of realistically mid-late January for the new chief. So the what's chair. the plan? So he's hired, in, he's hired end of December, let's pretend. Well, he's not even hired till January. I mean, he's not in the chair till February. Yeah. So what do we do for, let's say it's a 30-day. Yeah, so we get six weeks of interim chief. Interim chief. We should start thinking about that now, Mr. Kamala. Do we have a chief that wants to hang for another 30 or 60 days? Or uh, I was just, no, yeah, I was just going to ask if I there's... I'd probably have to approach that outside of public session. But, yeah, we, we need to start thinking about the, the, an interim plan for, for 45 or 60 days. I just don't see anybody in the chair January 1. It's not happening until February 1, if we're lucky. Okay. Let's, let's start thinking about that, Mr. Kamala, and what, what might be the options. <laughs> okay. So, anything else on that topic? Look at him over there. Oh, oh. Everyone's on. I know, exactly. His plane tickets to the Bahamas are January 2nd. So, um, any, more, any more questions on the, the fire chief process? Okay. Let's go back to item sev 6, um, which is Ko Sushi and Grill Kino application. The board will have a discussion whether to object to a Kino license being granted to Ko Sushi and Grill by the Mass State Lottery Commission. Um, so again, they've applied for one. We have a 21-day period, I guess, to object is what the answer is. And I think the question is, does the, is this something the board feels strongly about? There were, nobody was coming in tonight to talk about this, right, Mr. Kamala? So we were always going to be on our own. 
fairly clearly, unless the chief. Where is it changing. going? Is it right across here? It's Co. It's oh, the ones, oh, the oh, folks oh, on oh, South, South Street. Street. Sushi place. Oh yeah, yeah. So does anybody yeah, have any does. comments on this? Any any desire to object, Mr. Kamal Kino? In this town is becoming entirely too common, in my opinion. I mean, we're. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I don't. Does it have anything to do with the Mass Gaming Commission? It's our payback for not going for the casino. Our, um, Conscionable to have another one going. Is, are, is this, will this be the only, uh, are there only going to be two now, which is the one next door and then that one? Do they have it at Cornell's? Does Cornell's? Yeah. Co somebody else, I've been somewhere that has Kino. Cornell's, Cornell's had it forever. And somebody has it, yeah. Bill's has it, right? It's Bill's has it. getting it. Bill's, Bill's has it. it. Um, Bill's. Bill's has it. Anybody else? Doesn't the Chinese restaurant have it? Dynasty. In the bar. I've only been in the Dynasty. bar a couple times. Dynasty. I don't know. So through the chair, are there, are there pros and cons to Kino being out there? Pros are I can play Kino. Con is people. I in think the about. I think about. Well, a lot of the places that I've been to that have Kino, and generally they aren't the places that I think of being in Hopkinton. Right. Not saying I, all. I, but a lot. I think there's a lot of Kino going in town here. Okay, so the question is, what does the board, if anything, want to do about it? We have a um, we have a limited time frame to object. Did they come to us yet? They've applied. They apply through the state. Did they physically come in here at all? No, no. Oh, they they apply through the state, and then the state serves us notice, and we have a certain number of days to object or take no action. If we take no action, the state has the ability just to right. pass it. We have basically this week. To, this, to do it. It, it, it. The 21 days ends next week. Anybody on the board have any feelings about Kino and whether we want to pursue? We, well, I think we have to be reasonable and fair in how we administer our view. And this is up on South Street. You know, it's not, it's, it's in our industrial B district. You shouldn't have to drive very far to play Kino? Is that no, I'm just saying, you know, when it, uh, I don't play, I don't know. No, not, it's not next to the school. It's not next to the church. It's not. I mean, it's. I just. I just don't feel like hanging out in a place that has kino screens all over the place. I, I find them. I, I used to them like pretty. hanging out at uh, not hanging out, but going to co every now and then. I can't say that I want to have a nice dinner, and be looking at kino screens. But again, that that's not the public. No, I know that's not that's, that's not a, our purview. Wanna, but I'm just saying from a personal level. Uh, I mean, all right. So does anyone on the board want to make any? Have we ever voted things? not to allow a keynote to come in elsewhere in town? I think we've only ever had one, and that was two weeks only, ago. Yeah. I think this is. I mean, there's a veritable tsunami of them coming in right now because we've had two in my we had one, six year tenure. We said no. No, bills came in a couple of weeks ago, and we let it fly. Yeah. Not without the similar reservations being raised, but I mean, the question is from a public policy standpoint. So if we do it's nothing, it's going in. Right. Okay. Uh, I make a motion we take no action. Well, I don't think we need a motion for that. Oh, I think okay. just think we don't need to do it. I mean, does anyone want to make a motion? That's all I want to ask about, about objecting to this. Okay, hearing general. I move that we get an online petition. This pleasure, but no motion. Uh, we'll move on. Okay, so that's that item. Uh, on to liaison reports. Mr. Mosier, any liaison reports? Nothing at this time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Herr. <coughs> Nothing at this time. Mr. Catino. Nothing at this Mr. time. Mr. Sestari. Uh, tomorrow night, the Hopkinton Cultural Council is meeting, and uh, they're voting on distribution of various grants to local groups uh, for cultural activities. And uh, last week, we had special town meeting. At that special town meeting, uh, there was uh, one of the items was through Parks and Rec, and they're trying to build an indoor practice facility down at Fruit Street, and in another week, that will be going to the polls as well. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, on to the town manager's report, Mr. Kamalo. Town manager report. The only report I have for the board is that we have received notice from uh, uh, Mr. Chuck Joseph that board members are invited to the opening gala for the center of the Yards. Your tickets will be available to go. Are they going to have Kino there? 
All right, a generous pseudo invitation to an ass at the town controls. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Can we take each other? <laughs> really? That's a great one. <laughs> go alone. Really bring it on home. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, future board agenda items. Mr. Starry. Nothing. Mr. Gattino. Nothing. Mr. Mosier. I'd like to talk about uh, the intersection in the parking lot over at uh, the former Colellas property. <clears throat> okay. Um, we've requested that in the past. Yep. Yep. Okay. 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 Anything else? Oh. Mr. Howard. We've got plenty on our plate at the moment. Thank you. Okay. All right, Chair, I'll a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present, not voting. That's unanimous. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good evening, Ben.